benvenuti a Roma al secondo con Welcome to Rome at the second conference of the flipped classroom. I am very, it's a gr I'm very excited of being here with you today. I even saw some of you that have been excited just as me to see for the first time people that had only followed virtually on Facebook or on training online courses. It's a great excitement for us to be here for us today and uh, so many of us and also few of us because about a hundred people had asked to participate and they weren't able to because the hall was too small. Uh, but I promise that the next conference, the next meeting, we're going to organize it in a larger hall. And in fact, uh, we will be having smaller workshops also to help us focus and select uh, the items and the matters we're most interesting in. This is a very innovative uh, 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 conference. And even more innovative is even Professor Tullio De Mauro, who is here with us today, and he will be walking amongst you because we like personal contact, but he will talk about it more at length. I will add no more. Now I would like to give the floor to Professor De Mauro that with so much warmth has helped us since the beginning to choose this path that for us is turning out to be a beautiful path, a beautiful adventure where we discovered hundreds of teachers with a big heart, with a big passion for their jobs. So, Professor, good morning, first of all, and welcome to this conference. And and we hope to replicate this experience. Oh, oh, the volume is low. Can you hear me now? Great. I know I have to hold the mic close. Good. So, thank you. And as the leader just said, previous speaker, when I heard of the existence of the flipped classrooms, when I heard about this project, I immediately wanted to know more about it, and I tried to understand what it was all about. Not because I like new things. I'm a very traditionalist person. And I think that writing and reading, and for even before then, uh, when you learn to speak, well, it's an age-long experience. We hope that we will continue to. The first steps, the most difficult things, the entrance. Just imagine your first entrance into the realm of speaking. It is to be hoped that children are always born in good health and that they are attentive to what is happening around them in the first hours of life and that somebody is there, some adult, human beings around them, speaking to them. <laughs> And so the brain of the child is activated and is prone to, to identify, to capture these new sounds and how important they are. You know that children learn very, very quickly. There is a very important Argentinian neuropsychiatrist for children. His name is Jacques Milda. And he realized, he discovered this fact that perhaps it's worthwhile spreading more about, spreading information about. 
I will seize this opportunity of you here today. You're still attentive. Maybe for a few minutes, you're still listening to me. I thank you for this. So he realized that in 36 hours, children learn to do something extraordinary. They also learn the language from those who are nursing, the person who's nursing him, who changes his diapers. Does he learn the language? Well, not yet, but he makes a first step to understand how the person who is feeding him, who is nourishing him, how, he's, how that person speaks. And in 36 hours, everybody practically, all of them, learn to do something that could appear strange, but the teachers are, should always take into account when they, when they speak, when they listen, when they try to understand what their students are saying. So these firstborn, these toddlers, learn to understand the so-called prosodic profile, the prosodic trend of the sentences or of words uttered. If, if you try, speaking a different language, children don't like it. Psychiatrists are very clever in this. They use a traditional mechanism, and the more the child is happy, the more he actually takes in notions. Now, we also have other tools. They, with electrodes, we register the variations of the brain waves where we can understand how happy the child is. If after 36 hours, the child hears the voice of their mother or the voice of another person who is speaking the language of uh, the of the mother he's very happy but if he hears another person who is speaking a different language even his own mother he takes in much less information and the brain waves tell us that he doesn't really appreciate so what did he learn why do i just call it a prosodic profile because if the mother who is bilingual does not speak the same language that she spoke the first hours of life and she switches for example from spanish to italian the child even though the voice is the voice of his mother, he prefers another person who will continue to, speaking, to speak to him in Spanish. I don't know whether I made myself clear. It means that he identified, he captured this thing that isn't much spoken about in books, but that the main actors know much about. That unfortunately television speakers are unaware of and they speak without actually taking care of this aspect. A, pre a person who speaks normally knows how important this, this prosodic movement that changes from one language to the next, only from it changes especially for example, when Alfonso Modina, who now speaks an excellent Italian, when he speaks, you hear that he does not imitate the prosodic profile with which we speak, but he will get there because he's very clever, I can assure you. He already went a long way. You speak Italian, don't you? Spanish. So he will be speaking in Spanish. So you will listen to the prosodic profile in Spanish. So what would you like to innovate? 
You want to innovate? Nature made us in this way. Our mother made us in this way. The mothers, the test tubes, and the ovules, the sperm, they made us in this way. It's hard to innovate. So I will be conservative about this, ensuring that the child, boy or girl, is in a healthy environment with affectionate people who speak to them. And this is the best way for them to learn how to speak. Also, other things are learned very easily. The amazing progress in the scientific and technical sectors and also the psychological and educational studies of the past 50, 60 years have, don't, haven't really affected, in other words, they haven't affected, they have affected the understanding, but not the modification of uh, the calculations of the world of numbers. How we all approach this, somebody told us, are you have a, what, your little finger is one, uh, lift another finger, then there is two, and another finger, and then you have three. I don't know how your mother or father actually taught you, or if you had a nanny, how they taught you the first numbers, what was your approach. So how did you learn? You learned step by step that there is this strange series of words, one, two, three, four, I had a sister who used to annoy me, and she said, there was, the once upon a time, there was, you know, and uh, this was uh, a fairy tale, and then uh, there was this fairy tale, this story that was, you know, to learn children how to learn their num, to teach children how to learn numbers. It went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and she just continued insisted with this uh, with this children rhyme that went one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's how you learn a series. All the things that information technology or that the uh, scientific progress and the studies, that all, all the evidence, all their findings wouldn't be possible without this very primitive approach. At a certain point, not always this one was something new. When? Well, we don't know when exactly, but certainly at least for the past four or five thousand years. We know that for sure. The linguist scholars know that. For the past four or five thousand years, we have learned to count, to say one, two, three, four, five, to distinguish a set of objects according to the number of elements they contain until a certain point. And then we gradually learn to do it also with larger groups. So there are fundamental things like to speak, to count, on which we could be more attentive. And we could be particularly attentive in order to continue doing what has always been done, to reaffirm what has always been done. So, be careful to when you say, oh, we have to change. Well, yes, 
change, but why? What's the advantage of a change? What what is the what is the improvement that is brought about by this change? So on the basis of this question, not because the flipped classroom was something new, funny, was a nice way of saying, let's change everything. That wasn't the interesting the focus. It wasn't the most interesting thing. I don't think that's the most interesting thing. I'm saying it because school is, in all countries, is a big business for those who sell educational products, starting from school books to all the mat school materials and all the traps that in the past years, imagine so many of us have uh, experienced in the school, in classrooms, in schools, and then just kept in, uh, in the a cellar where you find so many piled up materials, photocopy machines, and just all of that equipment that is no longer in use. Old telephones, remember the old telephones, the black ones? Good morning. <coughs> there are some seats in the back. This gentleman that just walked in. <coughs> Last row, well. It, it, I'm in solidarity with you. I see we're, we're more or less, we're peers. We have the same age, so. I have three quarters, three quarters of a century. I'm a three quarters of a century old. Wow, good. So, what is interesting? What I consider particularly interesting, I'd like to share it with you, and that's the reason why I'm here with you today. What's interesting about the flipped classroom? Well, you know, I think you all know if you're here, you know what the elements of interest are. to ensure that the teacher is ensures that he has the tools enabling the replacement of his own of his own words of his own physical presence while he is explaining something especially, for example, some difficult uh, concepts. Uh, we know that what we teach, whenever we teach, there are some difficult concepts, and we know that these difficult concepts are difficult, in fact, to understand in order to proceed for those who are studying. So these are sometimes our stumbling blocks, and so uh, this also involves, extends to the all the entire sector of information, all the information that is being conveyed. So this aspect, this aspect, the teacher can decide to replace himself or to learn how to replace his own physical presence or else to look around, look for some other, other way. I know that uh, there is a database that is being created. Maybe I think you, you all know this. I didn't know about it. I just learned about it a few days ago by Mr. Maggioni told me. He's a bit distracted. He's, that's not comforting. I think he's, is it true that there's a database? Good morning. I was trying to communicate with you. I understand you have other things to do right now, but is it true? <laughs> is it true there is a, a database that collects of films and movies? 
you will talk about this, right? So all of this material will be made is made available to teachers who can decide. And how much do they pay? Nothing. Really? That's nice. I didn't realize. That's all for free. Okay, I'm gonna go back on that. So they don't have to pay anything. But they have to use their brain, don't they? But they have to look. They have to see whether it's convenient, whether the film, the short clip. They're watching that moment while they're doing their job to follow and improve the, the, the student's learning process. So teachers should either learn to, to make these short movies himself or else he has to reason about this, what the database uh, offers and select material he needs which is much better to use uh, a school text because they're on the criteria that they're colored or non-colored pictures. And then this thing is put online. And now here we need the technology, of course. And the youths we work with who can watch this uh, this film, this movie, possibly before before we the school program reaches reaches that stage, which is a bit difficult, is it? Yes, no. So if we manage to if this movie is not too long, it's well done, it's uh, understanding also the difficult passage, and it's a, this is a difficult passage that the student risks not being able to, to follow completely. Suddenly, during the one hour lesson, is an area of freedom. And what should be done in that hour? We shouldn't repeat what was already conveyed by the film. The film could also be a written book, could also replicate what was written in a book. If we work well with the students, if we understand there is cooperation between us, because learn so that the learning process continues. So if this work is done well, I will not have to repeat what is inside the book. Because what's inside the book is not enough. It's a chance that I spoke with you. Maybe I should underline that it's very different to read something or listening to the same thing. You know, of course, uh, academics and literary academics are very aware of this. So are novelists, and uh, Daniel Pennock used to highlight this, you know, whether reading, you know, like Chaucer or listening to Chaucer is a different thing. I read these texts over and over and I managed to capture speaking with the right tone of voice, not with just a boring kind of, you know, reading, but actually modulating my voice. Even so, even Chaucer could be appreciated, and certainly Dan Daniel Pennock appreciates and understands much more through says that one understands much more through the direct words of the teacher. So. When we don't have the film that can be shown, that can be screened ahead of time, certainly, it's not 
nothing. Uh, it's no trivial thing for the teacher to talk about what is written on the book. And to say, speak about what is written in the book from page 40 to page 43. The voice is irreplaceable. And so the, the movie replicates and, and conveys all of this and makes, makes it useless, makes this repetition useless at the beginning of uh, class, of what the film already said, and of what probably, in terms of concepts, is written in, in the book. So what can I do? What is my role at that point? I can see whether the film has been really understood, whether in spite of everything there are difficulties, and if these difficulties depend on different degree of learning of the students, which is not the same for everyone. There are different paces, individual paces, even idiosyncrasies that are different. So I discover this uh, varied world of the uh, different ways of understand uh, different concepts, uh, some concept, complex concepts understood in different ways according to the students. So I can uh, understand this difference with the different, uh, also with the screening of a movie. So, when I try to understand when what they have understood, I understand something else. The different ways with which they are studying. Their different capabilities, the different tools they have to continue their learning process. And I understand if I made the film or the colleague in the neighboring school did this film, if there's something wrong in this film. It was fashionable a few years ago, I think several years ago. Then I don't know why we just... There was this concept that the, the, the teacher must be capable of calling himself into question. That was a very trendy concept a few years ago. So the teacher calls into question the tools he uses to see whether they are fully understood. And if he realizes that there is something wrong, some passage that is, was taken for granted and is not obvious at all to the students, there used to be some books of geometry that were even nice books and in these books constantly I hope there are math teachers here the book says it is evident that it's evident maybe for you it's evident for you who wrote this book so So one could realize that in this movie it was taken for granted a concept that is not evident at all. And so in that case, you have to review, you have to put yourself into question, you have to improve. And uh, the colleague could say, you know, maybe this point needs to be explained a little bit more in detail. So the teacher learns from those who are learning. He might even resort to the time available to look around in the classroom to try to identify those who are learning the most, those who are a bit lagging behind.
A few years ago, there was a teacher of uh, one fifty-hour courses for adults training courses. He called it the submarine method, which is the method of Don Milani. Was the method of uh, teachers who managed to create a cooperative atmosphere in classroom. Adopt this uh, technique. They can ask best students to to help the students who are, have difficulties, explain them, uh, make small groups of students, and, and and you know share this information. This this approach of small groups is is difficult to implement here. For example, we could create small groups with the churches. I think I think these churches are just nailed to the ground. Are they not? So if we create small groups, maybe we could manage. Donations. We could ask a little at the time that the school desks are not only appropriate to the age of the students, which isn't always obvious, but that they're also mobile. They can be shifted around the class. So they, we, they could, you know, we be used to create small groups. Like when there are two seats together. Like in kindergartens. And in seminars. The German scholars call them the privatissimum, where only the best ones were admitted to give, to be part of small groups, and then they shared it with the teacher. And in these privileged places, good morning. You want me to stop speaking, don't you? Oh, you can't hear me over there? Oh, it's a distance? Okay. Oh, that, that was the only problem. All right. So, we have the possibility of working in a submarine mode to ask for the cooperation and the help of the more better, best students to help those who have difficulties. So, they may all improve together to experience that extraordinary a situation that you are all familiar with, I have no doubt that when you made a national exam, if you did this national exam, if you were given the honor of uh, have doing a national or the possibility of uh, taking a national exam, so I have no doubt that in that moment you were all you were excellent. So. Repeating, having to teach, I think, makes us understand a lot of things. The things that we had already learned, having to transmit them, finding. Yes, no, I'm not crazy. And the then repeating. When understood. There are many levels of understanding. It's a never-ending process. We always discover that there was some point we hadn't understood how important it was and what it was really what it really meant. A great philologist called De Leo Spitzer used to say uh, the Literary critique means to read, and several times when we read, several times, the third, the fourth time, we realize there was something we hadn't understood. Uh, so, the flipped classroom provides the opportunity of experiencing all of this, of testing it out. And there is no longer an urgent need of the ritual of an oral exam. 
because I spent an hour, you know, having an oral exam student by student. And this is also a problem of uh, remembering what is being done in class, of taking notes. I had a teacher. He was from Calabria, this teacher, to south of Italy. He's a very good teacher. And, but he never did any oral tests, no tests in class, and that was strange. The, the high school I went to, it was hard to put the school desks together and to create, you know, little circles with the chairs. We would have all been kicked out of school if we had done that. It was just forbidden. And so he used this system. He asked some of us to get up, and he just sat near us, and he started to speak with those who were, who were seated. He sat among the students, and it was nice, and we all stood around them. But every once in a while, he got up, he ran to his desk, and he took notes, he put mysterious dots. And even the most skilled ones never managed to decode. I'm not joking about this, because really, from that classroom, actually, a gay terrain, the very famous uh, uh, phys physical uh, uh, physicist, and another another very renowned scholar that taught, taught microwave engineering, very talented. Uh, we all try to identify these dots, but these dots were linked to the answers to the tests that he made. And so we had to learn a system of taking notes or of recording the information in our brains, of just trying, maybe we need a video camera today, like he's the person behind me is doing with a video camera, he's filming. So. Beh, questo mi pare straordinario. Mi pare che si offra. So I think this is uh, truly marvelous. The fact that we could do what uh, my old professor from Calabria did in order to try to understand what people were learning, what they were understanding uh, while they were reading those books and how those students had to be helped out in learning. Or how perhaps to exploit those smarter students in order to make them perhaps help the others, those students who perhaps were lagging a bit behind or were struggling. So this is what we have to do. So this is something innovative because uh, the system at the moment is very crystallized with an explanation, with the formal exam. And so, of course, this new procedure is innovative, of course. It's disruptive, as a matter of fact, to be able to make the most out of our learning system, to foster, to promote cooperation within the classroom. And, of course, I know that this is not easy at all. It entails a cost on the part of teachers, some effort, but also it brings about good, positive results. It also requires intelligence. It requires study as well. Study, ongoing study, continuous study over what is being taught in order to understand those topics better, to make a better use of the tools, but also better knowledge also of the students themselves.
So this is an advantage. This is a system, an innovative system that traditional teaching cannot obtain. Now, as to technologies, technologies, as a matter of fact, are rather poor in this case. We're not using much. We don't need much because, as a famous author explained in a, in a book, there are many books being published over this topic. And I'm doing the prefaces of the introduction to many of these books, as a matter of fact. So books that talk about the flipped classroom. In fact, I'm trying to uh, actually help out these people to uh, pull in my knowledge. Now, it's very interesting that uh, publishing houses at the moment are becoming very interested in this topic, the topic of flipped classrooms. This means that there is a market for those new innovative teaching systems for this flipped classroom. Now, just one last word. The market. I just talked about the market. Now, I went recently to Sardinia uh, some two weeks ago for, for a project that we're launching over a university aimed, uh, or actually a course aimed at uh, uh, providing refresher courses for teachers. And some people, while I was there, were telling me, what is this awful thing, this flipped classroom that you're talking about? They uh, didn't like it at all. What, what did they mean by that when they said that there was something awful? Well, they told me that in Sardinia, there are some people who are uh, talking in schools about the flipped uh, classroom, and, and they are uh, showing some movies over the flipped classroom, which are not free of charge at all, which are paid for, and which explains some topics, for example, the theorem of Thales or, or others. Now, this is not the flipped classroom at all, because the flipped classroom is something different. It's not something that you can make money out of, not at all. So we have to be very careful to this. We have to pay attention to that, to not making that mistake. Very well. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor De Mauro. Now, uh, he surprised us, <laughs> as uh, he always does, because he told things that we did not expect, neither from a former ministry for, uh, Minister for Education nor from a very famous linguist. Now, as to the uh, Promessi Sposi, he told us something very interesting. Now, and also has to do other things as well. Now, I'd like to hand the floor over to Grazia Paladino. And she will talk about the things that we have done throughout these two years, uh, a period in which we have paid a great attention to what the professor just talked about now. Not making that mistake, the mistake of, uh, you know, uh, trying to do business out of all of this. Because, in fact, you may have noticed when you came to this hall that we don't have any sponsors at all. And we refused sponsors because we want to create a community of peers, of teachers who take part in this project voluntarily, free of charge. Very well. Now, Grazia Paladino. Good morning to everybody. Now, I'd like to officially welcome you all to the second uh, conference uh, on the flipped uh, classroom. Now, it's a great uh, honor to take the floor now. And I thank uh, Fabrizio for having given the floor. Now, it's very difficult, however, to take the floor after the speech of uh, Professor De Mauro, after his lecture over innovation, what innovation means, and what the flipped teaching uh, methodology means. And what I'd like to talk at this point is something rather different. I'd not like, I would not like to just say that we've done things perfectly, that we, what I would not like only to talk about what we did as teachers, but I would also like to insist on what we 
can still do in the future and what we can ask our students to do as well because the flipped classroom involves a collaborative learning where we work together not only as teachers but also with students and this is something that I believe we uh, have started doing we've had some success because we started with a very small number of quote flipped teachers of people who wanted to create a flipped classroom who wanted to radically change the way in which things were taught and we created now a theme a, te uh, a team sorry a full-fledged team a large one which is devoted to this it's a mission that we have now we uh, were tired of, of uh, doing classes as we did in the past and we decided to change things now how was everything born how did we decide to do all of this now as you can see in this slide the flipped classroom was born as you know at the end of the 90s now some attempts uh, such as the Kand Academy uh, had success they created uh, they had a business uh, they created a business over the video lectures there are two uh, uh, teachers in the United States, which at the end of the the past century uh, decided to uh, develop this flipped classroom. So they wanted to invert the point of view. The innovation lies not so much in the video le lesson. No, the innovation is or lies in the fact that we want to create a collaboration with our students in order to include everyone within that process. So how was the Association for the Flipped Didactics born? Well, it was born uh, not in a garage, perhaps as it happened uh, in California, but in an Italian bar. And three people met at this bar. Mm and they shared some positions and they met and what were their needs well I th I think that we share the same needs they had a, a dyslexic uh, a son uh, uh, with special learning needs there was also a law that uh, existed back in those times that involved all of those children who had special education needs and then also those students who were rather annoyed over how things were being taught in a classroom. And then we also talked about a book uh, that existed on Amazon, a book published by those two people there. Bergman is the older one and Sam, two chemistry teachers who wanted to create this flipped teaching methodology and and they published that book that you see there and then there is also an article by our uh, professor De Mauro a great supporter who an article published on the international which talked about the flipped classroom so now, probably you too felt the urge to come here this morning to this hall. Some of you already had made some experiments in with flipped classrooms. Now, I was not among the first three people to start all of this. So why did I decide to opt in to take part in this uh, project? Well, because I was writing a thesis uh, uh, concerning learning disabilities, especially in the field of maths. Uh, I don't have a, a child that suffered from dyslexia, but f suffers from other uh, uh, learning disabilities. He had some problems, in, uh, especially in elementary school, so I tried to help him out. And then there was a book, that book published by uh, her, uh, Bergman, that I bought on Amazon. Then there were also Facebook groups. Now, Facebook is not just a, 
uh, uh, something that we use for our free time, but it is also a very powerful tool because I was able to meet with Maurizio, to meet with Maurizio, with Susanna, with Fabio, thanks to Facebook. So at that point, we were all aware that this new way in which to teach at school would be helpful for everybody. It would subvert what the traditional lesson had been up to now. A lesson which seems to work for everyone, but which in fact doesn't work for anybody. As Professor Finati said, he will come here this morning, this type of teaching methodology is a pedagogical f fiction. So that it means that I, uh, I'm uh, I'm acting as an imposter, as a teacher, and uh, you're uh, pretending that you're learning, but you're not. And if, you're, uh, and if you behave well, you will receive good votes. If I go to uh, a middle school in the province uh, of some cities, for example, then at that point there will be some problems because this system doesn't work and this pedagogical fiction does not work and because it only involves the best students and all the others are left on their own. So th here you can see some statistics uh, over uh, classrooms, especially in high schools. Now 25, there are 25 students, two with disabilities and are followed by a special teacher for two hours. Then there are uh, students with uh, DSA, and we have to help help them because this is what the law says. Um, so we have to help them out based on on the law. Now, in 2013, I started tackling uh, that problem. Uh, that learning disability, and then there are these seven students that are just bored. And then there are the difficult students, the worst ones. No, I don't want to use this word. I don't want to use the, worst, the word worst. There are people, there are students who have some problems, very s serious problems. They don't suffer only of dyslexia or other learning disabilities, but they have uh, renounced to, to school. They have created some walls. And, and those are the students that are, are more problematic. Then there are five students who are, are hiding, and they seem to be the best students. Um, however, they're only uh, following along or playing along that fiction that we were talking about. Then there are the average uh, students, mm, the laggards or the good ones. Uh, there are the excellent ones as well. Now, our school 15 days ago was received an award from the United Nations because it's considered an inclusive school. Now, of course, our school shouldn't be inclusive only in terms of the laws because we started promoting laws already from the 70s, but that's not enough. Laws are not enough. We have to actually implement them. The inclusive uh, school should not forget that there are somehow uh, sometimes endowed students uh, and with inclusive school, I have to take charge also of those students, of the excellent ones who have to be tendered for, who have to receive the proper attention. If they are annoyed, or if they renounce, or if they hide, that is a problem. So this picture here, I I shot on uh, Tuesday in my classroom. Now this is what I do every day in, in school. It's a laboratory. I try to make it as creative as possible. Now in this picture, there's was one of these students who has renounced to studying. And uh, for two years, I've tried to involve uh, him because sometimes he's wearing a hood in class. He doesn't look at me. Uh, but now things have changed. He, he's, he often smiles at me. He looks at me, stares at me in, in the eyes. And perhaps he won't do his, his, uh, his work at home, but his class work at home. 
but nevertheless he has attained the eight key competences um, including those which are basic which is not just the language it's the social competence it's the ability to be able to um, to interact with others because otherwise those people will be left on their own and will not be able to uh, interact with society so we started this project a project which we wanted to call as follows inverting special educational needs because we want everybody to attain their didactic objectives and so in the year 2013 we uh, submitted this project to, to the Italian uh, Ministry for Education and in uh, July 2013 the ministry acknowledged that project and said that the minister the ministry was interested in it i.e. in uh, preparing some teachers uh, for this flipped classroom so when the first courses were started we already had 300 uh, teachers who took part in these uh, courses at the beginning they were just online and then we diversified the offer and we also held in presence courses in uh, january 2014 we published the first operational the first and only operational manual a handbook a handbook which teaches you how to uh, how to promote how to actually carry out these flipped classrooms in february 2014 the association changes its name and it takes on the new name the flipnet association now we decided to organize the conference in February because in February in fact we celebrate the creation of the association in September 2014 a larger number of teachers decided to take part in our activities uh, there were uh, teachers uh, who uh, uh, tried to uh, promote all areas of knowledge and sharing their opinions with other teachers as well. For example, this morning I met with some uh, teachers who took part in these courses that I was teaching back in the past. And we exchanged so many uh, messages uh, on forums, on, uh, on uh, groups over the internet. And it was very, very nice to actually meet in person here today last year the first official conference took place which was organized as this year together with mondo digitale and the president of this association will take the floor afterwards he is in charge of promoting the use of uh, of this uh, digital culture in the classroom of the digital tools in the classroom and then there's also summer school a summer school that we started last year three four days we received a, a, a lot of uh, teachers and us uh, trainers uh, ourselves we did take part in the activities we tried to create a flipped classroom for the teachers themselves so this is how we tried to carry out our courses we want to explain to our teachers what an active listening means we're not just uh, doing things traditionally but we're trying to promote things or do things in, in smaller groups in, in a more active way and uh, starting from that period uh, the media started uh, 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 being interested in this topic in the flipped to classrooms uh, uh, for example, there's a very popular program here in Italy which uh, uh, talked about the flipped classroom. Quark, it's the name. It's, uh, uh, of course, a rather brief show, but in, in only five minutes. However, we, they, tried, they uh, interviewed Maurizio 
to try to learn from him as much as possible about the flipped classroom. And also Eros Grossi. They interviewed Eros, Eros Grossi as well. Then one month after, there was a, a, a longer uh, a longer interview in which also the students were interviewed and their opinion as well was uh, uh, was shown. And this is very important. I, I, I try to involve the students very, very often. Uh, I, I interview them on a regular basis to try to receive feedback from them, to try to understand what they think about what I've been teaching to them. And they're very sincere, I must say. They provide us with the feedback, which is very, very important in order to improve things, in order to, you know, start questioning ourselves, as Professor De Mauro said before. This year, we uh, received so many more uh, applications from teachers, perhaps also uh, due to uh, to new law that promotes such programs. So we're slowly uh, sowing some seeds, which we hope will, uh, and we're sure will, will blossom. Now, of course, as Professor Damario, we're trying to use all tools that we have available in order to reach all possible students, and to leave no one behind. In the year 2015, we continued, and then in the year 2016, too, in these two years, in the year 2015, we started some webinars, free of charge ones. On our website, you can see the recordings of the first five. In March, there will be another one. In these webinars, the teachers can meet freely. You don't have to subscribe to the program at all. And you can talk and 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 receive information over some themes that involve are involved with the the uh, flipped uh, teaching methodology, but not only. Uh, for example, Fabrizio talked about uh, authentic uh, material. Uh, I talked about other educational topics. In the last three webinars, uh, we focused in particular on l mathematics, math laboratories. Uh, Ferrigno talked about that. And then Vittorio Paradisi talked about history, history with the uh, flipped classrooms. And then there is something very innovative that well, I wasn't aware of that Alessandro Bencivegni talked about uh, a couple of, man of months ago. I'm referring to the social, to learn and to teach foreign languages. Because, in fact, he's a, a French language teacher. So Professor D'Amato was talking about this before. In this year, we've been organizing so many things. It wasn't easy, I have to say this, because, of course, we uh, weren't able to uh, involve all topics all, uh, or, or, or do all things. However, and the work was very hard. Uh, not uh, it involved not only me and Maurizio, Maurizio and I, of course, uh, but there were so many other colleagues who helped us out. Francesca Sartogo, Eranz Momodica, Salvo Menzac, Chiara Versozzi, Rossella De Luca, for example. Rossella De Luca, at the moment, is now a headmaster. She became a headmaster. And uh, we were talking uh, at, over the phone last day, a couple of days ago, and uh, uh, I was asking her, do you want to continue working with us? Because I'm aware that, you know, being a headmaster is a tough job. And she says, no, I want to continue doing this because it's a very helpful thing in order to be as close as possible to our students. So in uh, high schools, a lot is being done. In middle schools, too. In, we're doing a lot of things with Italian, for example. And also, uh, as to my subject, uh, Roberta Ferrigno and Colanis are in charge with this. And then there's also elementary school. Rita Fostinella uh, is also was involved with that. Then in that link, from that link, you can see all the information that I 
have referred to. Now, last year, we talked about this map, the map that you see there on the slide. It's a map of flipped teachers. Now, it's a website, an ancillary one to ours, with the link that you will find on our website, on the FlipNet one. It's a website that was created by a student himself, a very bright student. They were taught to create websites, and they created this website with a, a search engine, with a map, a beautiful website, a website from where you can very easily find those teachers of the various subject matters in the various areas of where you live. And you can subscribe to the website. You can refer to, of course, you can put your name there but, and, and, and your school as well. And so we're increasing, we're slowly building up this database of so-called flipped teachers Then one other thing that was very helpful for me in order to get to know better Fabio and Maurizio are these two Facebook groups. Uh, they have so many, so many people uh, that have subscribed to them. Of course, they're not all active uh, subscribers, and this is, happens very often on the socials. However. There are so many posts that are updated daily. They exchange so much material or opinions on what is being done or what on what they would like to do. So this is a discussion group. The other one instead is a so-called repository group. I, it's a database where you can put uh, classwork divided based on the various subject matters on the various classes. At the moment, the material is rather limited. However, it's increasing and, when we're, and it's moving along. So now in July, at the end of July, we will start this other project that involves uh, also uh, high school teachers, um, uh, a new, uh, another uh, summer school in Levico, and then in November, there will be a conference on the new practices and we will meet with personalities, with so many people who uh, are trying to promote an inclusive uh, classroom, with European colleagues as well from Europe. And, and so in September, we will create uh, a, a list of good practices that involve all of the things that you've done with your students. Uh, and this will provide a forum to to share things here in Rome. So on the 30th of September, the title of the conference is the following. The past, the imperfect, the future that are flipped. And this is a title that explains very well what our idea, our concept of flipped classrooms is. So this is the, just the last slide. Here you can see uh, us, but there are so many other peoples that gave their contribution to the growth of our association. Now, those three people that met at the beginning in that bar are Maurizio, Susanna, and Fabio. Susanna is a fairy, I should say, because she does miracles, and, and she did wonderful things today as well to organize a conference. And then there are the four trainers, I'm among them. There are the two therapists as well. And they're involved with psychotherapy for those with special educational needs of students. And then those others that you see there who are in charge of uh, the uh, elementary school. Now, the other ones, the other ones are those that help us in uh, formation courses, uh, Fermino, Corranes, uh, Parruta. They help us out in the various modules of the course, uh, Tomato, Becchio, and uh, Eros Grossi, who help us in the uh, in-presence courses, which we held uh, throughout Italy in these past years. 
So here you can see a whole list of the various people who uh, are uh, involved with the various subject matters. There's also that student as well that you saw before who was involved with that uh, website. Andriano Meli, a new entry. He just uh, uh, came in and he's helping us with the editing of the, uh, of the clips that we uh, provide for the association, that we shoot for the association. Now, four words are very important for us, these, these words that you see there. Now, our experience, that's the first word, then building. We have to uh, change the way in which school is being done, but we also have to build things. We have to collect material which may be useful also to others who would like to change, who would like to question themselves. Sharing and good practices. These are the last two words. So we would like to involve as many people as possible. Uh, so many more people have come on board last year. So if you're willing to come on board this year to help us out, the door is open. It's always open because we can change the school. We see this daily in our classes. And we thought from the grassroots, we can truly do all of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for giving us all this information on Flipnet, how it came into being. And now I give the floor to Alfonso Molina, who has a title in his presentation that is beautiful. His presentation is Education for Life and New Environments of Digital Learning. It's what we always try to do. That's why we're so close to the digital world, because we also ensure that our students have lifelong learning process. Alfonso. We have to need to turn on the mic. I would like to talk about an experience that is being brought forward by the association Mondo Digitale. I think I've got about 20 minutes. So I will just take for granted two things. First, that we are living in a complex world that will become ever more complex in the 21st century. Just think that a survey carried out by Oxford University shows that today 47% of uh, jobs existing in the United States can be automized within the next 10 years. So we know that work, career is all undergoing rapid transformations, and this is the second thing I want to say. The school environment is undergoing transformations a complete transformation, the way in which concepts are being taught in the school system as a whole. <coughs> this is a very complex system in itself. And here you will see that this is where the countries can make a difference in the future. Those countries that will be able to understand how to promote a systemic learning system will certainly have a better results than those who do not understand this transformation. Now, I will, since I'm from Chile, I will start from a quotation of the Chilean constitution on the right to education. Edu the purpose of education is the full development of the human person in the various stages of life. This is an extraordinary dream, and it has to be as such. It has to be the dream of education. It shouldn't be only to train a person for the job environment. As we said, even this is undergoing pressures. It involves the full development of, the, of the individuals. And that's why we define the objective of education as 
as making a contribution to giving people the capabilities of building, innovating, and rebuilding personal ecosystems that will bring to the implement to the full uh, fulfillment of their lives in interaction and cooperation with others and in the practice of, of a responsible form of citizenship. This leads us to a concept of education to create an open mindset, an open thinking that is open to the world of enterprises, of the business environment. We have to be aware because their creation of their happiness is part of an ecosystem that involves the development of talents, personal capabilities. It involves eliminating fears. It involves relationships identifying the organizations we have to work with to be happy and so on to reach the entire world because today personal ecosystems have an element that reaches out to the rest of the world today with uh, Linux I can access to knowledge of the MIT in Boston and other forms of knowledge on the internet and so the creation of our personal ecosystem is involves the rest of the world the world is a scenario and this for us is the goal of education on this basis we created a variety of concepts that i will now explain first of all what are the dimensions of in the innovation of education? Well, what is the size? We are talking about a systemic understanding, and therefore the content of education is changing. The methods and the learning environments are changing, as we have learned until now on the flipped classrooms and the management of the educational systems in school is changing the training of teachers of teaching staff is changing governance and the politics of the educational system as a whole is changing and a set of systemic innovations are emerging like the flipped classroom that have an explanation to be part and parcel of the entire school system. So this process is extremely important and it should be viewed as a whole. And this is not an easy task because usually <coughs> when there are political debates on the process involving a change in education, for example, the political uh, uh, a sphere it talks about governments and uh, policies whereas uh, it should be a, um, a mindset and way of thinking that involves all aspects including all the various dimensions involved at the foundation digital world we are addressing four of these dimensions the content of education the methods of environment and the environment of learning the training of teachings and uh, the systemic innovations uh, we are not yet working on the governments of policy education and other aspects yet we created an integrating aspect that we taught that we defined lifelong learning lifelong learning has three major uh, sectors first of all uh, a knowledge a standardized knowledge that is changing with the inclusion of new technologies then there are key skills for the 21st century this is already recognized by this has been recognized already 25 years ago it's been acknowledged the need for creativity for teamwork for innovation for entrepreneurship for critical thinking all of these are key skills that have been acknowledged but they did not penetrate the educational system in a systematic manner there are many teachers who create activities of this kind but the system as such a school system as a whole did not create 
a systematic process that would allow for the integration of these skills. And this dimension, I think these are the most important dimensions, the most important aspects to create a better world that are the basic values for responsible citizenship. We try to work with these three aspects in our planning processes. At the same time, the concept of lifelong learning has three major kinds of learning. On the one side, we see a lifelong learning process, the kind of learning we have, we've known, in fact, always known. Then there are various aspects touching many areas of life. Now we see with the school and work uh, process and all the areas of life should be included in the learning process. Uh, until the transformational kind of learning. It changes the way in which we see the you, see the world, rather than passively, actively, with an entrepreneur approach that enables us to create our own destiny. Then there are various uh, learning methods that you are all very familiar with, customized and cooperative learning. We see it in the flipped classroom based on the project, on a problem, practice, experience, questions, based on the brain, brain, on brains, brain-based, authentic, linked to rea reality, based on technology, and also independent. That is a feature of the flipped classroom. All of these aspects are part of the lifelong learning that includes a set of methods, learning methods and processes here. We intend to give our contribution and that's why we created the concept of the uh, workshop of innovation. Workshop innovation network. These what is this innovation workshop? It, it, is it a physical or virtual environment for innovation and, and uh, for lifelong innovation and learning? It's a workshop for the experience of learning and the practice of innovation in all of its aspects in the civil and social environment. This is very important because for us, innovation becomes an educational channel. The education, the innovation process has an enormous richness of elements, of terms that go from the very fact of conceiving an idea and implementing it within society. And therefore, innovation becomes a channel of education, not only in technological terms, but also involving the social and civic realms that enables us to conceive new communities through innovation. It's an open space. This workshop is an open space, open to, 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 to enterprises, to universities, to all environments. In these innovation workshops that are emerging within the school environment, barriers fall down, barriers. And so we see that the school is constantly in touch with the local environment and is part of the surrounding environment. It's a place of encounter between new and old professions where the language is a language of creation, both traditional and digital, the language of innovation and the creativity to encourage uh, self-entrepreneurship, uh, professional growth, and improve the skills for the 21st century. So with this innovation workshop, we created a variety of areas that have serve various functions. These functions, in turn, are languages that in order to reach out to people, not only through creativity and key skills, but also with the concept of new technology and the new jobs that are emerging in the, for the future. So uh, ours is a guiding uh, process where we discuss together the complex world, this complex realm, and also the different career opportunities. For the past 20 years, we have been spoken about borderless careers. We know about this. A career without borders. We are in Italy. There is 20% of youths under 29 are unemployed. So these aspects are cru crucial in uh, 
in this process. Then we have the digital uh, workshop, an interactive uh, uh, sector for visual effects, robotics, uh, virtual reality, leadership until bu building, and today internet is everything which is the future of this century. These activities are areas that we have created in uh, the suburbs of Rome. Uh, these, as you can see on the slides, there are pictures of the activities of uh, guidance and interaction where we use uh, real-time uh, surveys for the resolution of problems with uh, tools created by the industry uh, created over the past 40, 50 years that never penetrated the school environment. These are ways of thinking, cooperative and creative tools that enable us to realize that we are all creative. Uh, we do planning activity with Lego Serious Play, with the Lego, with about 2,000 Lego pieces. We do teamwork and uh, leadership, and team building, with tools like uh, the 2Bs that you see here in the picture. We do, uh, there are laboratories for digital uh, tools. In cooperation with MIT, we have uh, robotics with uh, also with children equipped with the concept of uh, planning a very simple app that enables to uh, transmit the basic concepts of uh, planning even to children aged six or seven uh, in in the robotics in the field of robotics uh, laboratories of three anima D animation and visual effects that include computing software. Uh, 3D and visual effects, laboratories of video games with specific equipment, virtual re reality. This is a future of reality. Reality is changing. There are many concepts of reality that is not a physical reality. We talk about mixed reality, increased reality, invasive reality. This is going to change the very concept of education and how we will be addressing education in the course of a century. We have a large variety of educational programs. What you have seen are elements in, of a space, a space that enables us to carry out many educational problems in order to promote lifelong education in terms of education and learning. We work with young people and there are a set of uh, problems There's also that involves the responsible citizenship, social innovation, the grandparents on the internet that enables us to bridge the cross-generational gap. We also make projects where we create teams with young people and old people together and they are sent out and on the territory to discover the, uh, what are the problems at local level and follow an entire process for the words to reach a resolution of these local problems working for the community, for the benefit of the community. We work with artists and the school. We are about to promote the Media Art Festival. It will be launched in April. This festival right now there are 13 artists that are going out to schools to to promote with the students artistic artistic creations that will be displayed at the Maxi Museum and then will be displayed across the city. And this is a very important pro project because it enables us to establish a deep, deeper connection with multiple intelligences. We all know because we all different combinations of intelligence. With education until now, a classical a logical form of intelligence, what was called the, what is called now the left brain, whereas with art and the digital re environment together, art is combined. And, uh, at the, and is at the center of the scenario because it enables us to speak, uh, to communicate with the creativity of everybody that who can, who can develop their own intuition through art. They can develop these skills. 
and uh, to enhance uh, their creative skills and uh, opening up to various processes, enabling, enabling pupils to learn much more through with this mechanism, with this tool, uh, also educational robotics. The Rome Cup is a major event that we uh, do in March. There are international competitions. We do activities with artisans and youths, where artisans challenge the youths to solve the problems linked to this, uh, to this specific job. It's part of a job and work uh, uh, project to help uh, students uh, solve the uh, problems of the job environment with the guidance of tutors. At the same time, the students can contribute to craftsmanship, traditional craftsmanship that needs innovation as well. There are youths with new ideas that could be simply opening up a website to promote a specific project of artisans. So there is this constant di dialogue between reality and uh, uh, the, the school environment. We do planning uh, de dedicated only to girls, young girls, to encourage uh, uh, planning, also in cooperation with the U.S. Embassy, with the participation of an organ uh, U.S. Uh, American organization that has, in fact, promoted this project. And uh, the tutors go in school, they start working with the young girls, then there is this, what we call a, a hackathon, where the, the girls at the end of the week uh, they create video games and other virtual products. The most important, significant impact of this activity is self-esteem. The very fact of seeing that it's not only for boys, even girls can work in this environment and they have the same talented skills and can they create a video game like everyone else and the young people in transition is a program with the un we carry out with the unemployed we call them in transition because they're people who are trying to build their future and they are in the middle of the process and so we do create the project of self-awareness of the job environment this problem this uh, is is financed by google google.org that deals with the uh, social environment. It's, it's, it's a Google project that has enabled us to create a video games laboratories and the other, even the laboratories of animation, visual effects. This is a project that is developing very rapidly in the direction, first, a digression. We also work with the families. There are days dedicated to families during the week. So, as I said, the Google project is. Uh, um, going towards a youth accelerator. We are launching a call for ideas uh, to directed to young people so they may express ideas and interests to create teams and uh, create a project together. If they can participate in this area that I just described. They can work with us uh, like uh, for an internship and uh, and this could even lead to the startup environment, but we're not interested in the final goal, the entrepreneurship as a goal. The goal is self-entrepreneurship. That is what I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, the capability of building one's own world. So all of this physical world I described has also been connected in the virtual platform. We have a virtual innovation project called virtual.org, Virtual is one word that brings together the words physical and virtual. So it's called virtual. It's a new lifelong skill to see reality in an integrated manner that is equally physical and virtually. The two worlds are not separated, but rather are shaped into one. So this concept, with this concept, we launch this national um innovation workshop that has been adopted by schools and this has enabled us to uh, carry out a process of innovation that can be done in schools but also at local level and within community local communities and we are in touch with many different uh, organizations both in the school environment and in, in in a civil society. There isn't one single recipe because innovation, to create a, an innovation workshop inside schools or at territorial level 
in itself, it constitutes an innovation process. So the environment we're living in Italy, there are no resources and where very often we know that institutions are facing crises, they don't dedicate their resources and don't dedicate enough attention to these new emerging realities at local level. And so this workshop is to boost passion and build experience and spread knowledge on this sector within the school environment. We have to start with what exists they are quickly evolving in the sense that they can start at a very small level and they can grow and they grow from grassroots level. It's a bottom-up approach and so this project has been launched in 10 schools, in 103 schools in Italy and 10, 19 regions and now we're working on another project for equipment in schools. We created a networks on the kind of equipment they wanted to pre for a call for uh, a state-of-the-art laboratories. So we know it's a long way. It's not always clear, as you see in this picture. Very often, that's how we feel. That describes the way we feel. But the dream deserves all of this effort. Thank you very much. Ringraziamo Alfonso Molina per quello che ha detto. Ci ha veramente stupiti. Questa... Thank you very much. Uh, what we just uh, heard uh, was very, very interesting. The digital world is something that we feel very close to. And it's uh, helping us out very much in our schools. So we have to continue along those lines and we have to try to, to do more things as to that. I would like to thank uh, Al Dottore Bruno that you see here at the center. He will take part in the round table. He is the only one that will be showing slides. Daniela Lucangeli and Paolo Maria Ferri are not with us, but they sent the videos that are very nice. Uh, we are very pleased about this because they're very brief, uh, 15 minutes each, and in 15 minutes they explain things that would have been hard for us to understand with a longer uh, address. Now we're just waiting for Aldo Affinati. He's, he'll be here in a few minutes. I also wanted to uh, apologize with Mr. Torre Bruno. We, we, we made a mistake with the spelling of his surname. It's not Torre Buono, but Torre Bruno. So I think we can start with the video of Daniele Lucangeli. And I would like you to follow this very attentively in all the details. He says some beautiful things at a certain point. I said, look, it gives me goosebumps. And it's an audio. It's not a video. It's a phone call. But it's, it's very good sound. I think we can start. Sì, pronto. Buongiorno. Eh, buongiorno, professoressa Lugangeli. Good morning. Good morning, Professor Lucangeli. So, now we're ready to make some questions uh, for, uh, to the benefit of our public of the second conference, the flipped classroom. So, so we'd like to hear your opinion. It's a great honor, but it's also a great responsibility Now, uh, when we will uh, actually play this recording, you will be in India. So why is it that you are working there uh, and you're working and collaborating with the Gandhian <coughs> schools? Well, three years ago, three years ago, one of the most important conferences of the World Academy for Sciences took place that revolved around uh, learning uh, difficulties. And the president uh, of the uh, Gandhian schools uh, took the floor at that conference. And uh, at some point, uh, our, uh, our gaze met. 
and uh, we uh, we realized that we were talking the same language, although uh, of course we uh, were involved with different things in different world in different parts of the world. So. Uh, she told me that she was uh, organizing the World Conference of Gandhian Schools, uh, which are school, uh, schools of peace, and that she wanted me to come uh, to that conference. Now, Gandhian schools are schools uh, for uh, peace, and are Italian schools uh, for peace as well? Well, a very interesting question you're, that you're asking, because... Uh, uh, actually, peace is something that we have to conquer and uh, that we have to grow with. So I'd like to answer yes and no. There are some places here in Italy where a school is a school for peace. Yes. And schools where I sent my son, for example, that would make him grow. But then there are also other schools uh, that uh, need to improve. And I see this from letters from teachers and parents who are sending me SOS letters. So, of course, we have to uh, uh, talk about the complexity of the Italian schooling systems. It's not enough to just judge it. No, we have to understand how it works. There are so many resources. However, there are also some sore points that still haven't been solved, haven't been addressed. Now, these sore points are the ones that we would like to focus on. For example, the attention that is placed to those people who have special education needs. Now, what are the weakest po points, in your opinion? Now, uh, this recording will uh, be broadcast uh, and will be heard by so many people, and the topics that I will talk about are very sensitive. So, now, the need for special education is or involves everybody. Everybody needs it because everybody learns in a special way. So, if this is what you mean by special learning, then I am very happy that the school is involved with that because that means that the school is truly democratic and it provides everybody with the attention that they uh, need in order to allow those people to grow. However, if, if you're trying to pass on the hot potato to others, or perhaps uh, not to tackle the problem at all, then I, I'd be a little bit more uh, cautious uh, in that optimism, because I've received a lot of letters, so many letters asking for help. And uh, I was very struck by that. I mean, people that don't know me, who are asking help to me, uh, helping to help them f for their children with, you know, learning disabilities. And this means that, you know, the, the situation is not a good one. Now, this is something that I'm uh, very sad about. How is it that school, uh, which should provide the best support, the best help to those people, to allow them to grow is, in some cases, uh, not working. So this is an ethical problem, in my opinion. I, I couldn't define it better than that. It's an ethical problem. And uh, perhaps even teachers. Teachers, too, have special needs. Could that be? Yes, that's a very good in, uh, point, as a matter of fact. And, and, and the teachers, in my opinion, are fundamental in society because mm, they are the ones that allow the best of our generations to grow, to grow up. Now, there's an image that uh, I heard recently. I, there's a metaphor that I heard from some colleagues who were telling me that teachers allow souls to grow. Now, Penati says that education shouldn't be just uh, stuffing uh, information up uh, uh, people's uh, uh, stomachs and throats. And, uh, in fact, they shouldn't be that, because a teacher is a person who allows souls, uh, the psyche of people, to grow in harmony with their wholeness uh, of children. So, all teachers should be very well aware of all of that in their profession, because it's not only a profession, it's an art. And in fact, in the history of cultures, the teacher is viewed as much more than a teacher. He's viewed as a leader from a symbolic point of view as well, because he allows for, or he or she allows for growth. 
Now, how is it instead that teachers have become such so much less, have become only professionals? Quite frankly, I don't know why this has happened. Now, how can teachers learn to become sowers of uh, souls? Uh, very interesting question. Very difficult to address it through the phone, however. And I apologize for not being there with you. Unfortunately, I can address it only through the phone. But I promise I'll be with you next time. Now, how can they become sowers of souls? Uh, now, Seneca said, Homo hominis sacra res. What does that mean? That we have to uh, consider that to allow somebody to grow in the best of way, that thing is fundamental in, uh, in our society. So when teachers choose to become teachers, they have this already inside. It comes out as natural in their relationship with the others. Uh, of taking care of others. So how is it that from a professional point of view then this can turn out to actually be implemented? Well, this, of course, is more difficult because sometimes this, this mechanism is a bit too rigid because the teacher is called to know, quote, things that have to be taught to others in much the way thing uh, much the same way as they as they know them but this is a mistake because that's not what the teacher should do the teacher shouldn't uh, allow students to learn what he or she knows in exactly the same way not at all because they have to be to allow those students to enrich themselves through their own qualities and be able to transfer a thought that goes beyond the thought of their uh, teacher because the students are not uh, repetitors uh, uh, but they're active players. Uh, they shouldn't uh, learn a procedure that is being taught by the teacher. Not at all. They have to learn the strategy which is required to learn that thing. Because otherwise we transform learning from something that involves intelligence into something that just involves repetition. And the brain dies. Because otherwise it won't be able to grow. Now perhaps we would have to write another manifesto and hang it in our rooms. Uh, with those words that you've just said, because it's something that we've been teaching our students for the past, or actually our teachers for the past uh, two years. Uh, however, it's the same thing that Maria Montessori said when she was calling towards culture through activities, because uh, culture has to pass through activities, uh, through action, because otherwise uh, we'll get back to doing that situation that uh, Pinaka was referring about before, was referring to before. So we have to focus on cooperation. We have to promote uh, cooperation, sharing, responsibilities, active learning. Are we heading on the right road? Are we treading on the right road when we're trying to insist on all of this? Well, not only, but we have already achieved this, uh, many of these things in s many schools in Italy. This uh, uh, objective exists and in some cases was attained. Now, some years ago, at the conferences for the uh, Academy of Sciences. We were in Boston, and Fisher, a neurophysiologist, was telling us that one of the worst damages of the cognitive system is the, a mechanism, a learning mechanism, which is passive, because it turns off the creation within the brain. And it only stimulates uh, the, the um, memory of information. Um, however, this memory needs to be duly connected to the active processes of creation, of construction, a process that takes place within the learners. Uh, if it's not connected to all of that, then what happens is that that knowledge in the short term does not, is not able to transform information into thought the information provided by others into thought. This is very important because it involves the creative ability of the brain. Now, Fisher is not involved with the children, but molecules within our brain. And so he's t he was telling us, us that we have to oblige our brains to become not a computer, 
not uh, a passive uh, repetitor because otherwise it will be dead, uh, because otherwise our psyche will not uh, be promoted. Uh, a soul that is irrepetitable cannot be repeated. And I'm not trying to be poetic, but I'm just trying to say that it's very important because uh, it transforms people and it allows them to understand the world that revolves around them. So, of course, this is very, very important. And we're very, very, very eager to hear all of these things again in the future when you will come in person to our conferences. Very well. Now, one last thing. What would you uh, upturn in the Italian school? What would you, would you flip? in the Italian school? Now, oh, that, that's a difficult question. Now, when you flip somebody, you start from uh, somebody's feet. If you, if you turn somebody upside down, uh, money and uh, secret things will fall from his or her pockets. Uh, precious things, but also perhaps cigarette butts. You know, many also negative things will fall out. So we have to upturn the school, but not to throw everything away, uh, but also to distinguish what is very precious, all resources. And we have so many resources in our Italian school, and, but we have to distinguish those resources, precious resor resources, from those that I call cigarette buds, i.e. the negative things which, uh, you know, are rather negative because sometimes they, 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 they can set things ablaze. So we sometimes consider things that are only being dual, you know, good and bad. That's not enough. We have to, however, be able to make a good discernment over those things that work and those that don't. If a student learns well, uh, then uh, that, however, does not mean that he, that student is doing his best or her best. Also, errors, errors done with intelligence are very important because they allow students to grow. So what would I radically change in schools? Well, the vision. The vision whereby all is viewed as a diktat, whereas there is a, a very strict and rigid evaluation whereby the competences of, of children are being uh, measured. And we have to, however, distinguish also all of the resources, the treasure that we have. We have to distinguish in what was done in the past from what was done in, what is being done done in the future for the future generations this is a task that is ethical we shouldn't only be there to evaluate the comp to evaluate the competences of others but we have to do much more very well so thank you very much of course uh, all of these things that you said undoubtedly will be at the very heart of the things that we will be doing this year i hope the best for the works of your conference and i thank you very much for the high degree of esteem that you have showed in deciding to call me up and to uh, broadcast uh, the recording in the conference thank you maybe he is watching and streaming. She's watching and streaming, but I would like to thank Daniela Lucangeli for her address. It was extremely significant before giving the floor to Aldo Affinati and Mr. Torrebuno. I want to just highlight some of the sentences. I don't know whether you fully, uh, you fully actually listened to it. And, uh, I don't know whether it is somebody that can be described as somebody who cultivates a soul. On this question, I would like uh, to debate with you about this. I think it is a heart of our profession. Is a teacher a person who gives a series of services, or is a person who considers every student uh, uh, sacred, as uh, Seneca that was mentioned by Ducangeli, the repetitive uh, function. I, I was very much uh, hit by this, this concept as, as a chemist. It's hard for me to talk about pedagogy. But actually, but she mentioned the chemist, uh, a scientist like Fisher, 
who does not do pedagogy. However, he says that the main function of the brain, the psyche, is inhibited by a passive repetition. So in our schools, I think we do a lot of passive repetition. And perhaps this is what I, and this is what I'm worried about, and that's why we are here today. Maybe because our our mind, our psyche, has not been, of course, inhibited as uh, children, but we can we don't know that we we don't know for ourselves how would we have become if if it hadn't been this way. So let's examine the studies that have been carried out in these fields. Let's try to learn those aspects that can help us in our profession. And this metaphor also, that when somebody to, is reversed to take that person by the feet, if everything is a diktat, that there is no free processing of information, we are not cultivating souls we should print it as a manifesto, as the manifestos that you will find it in the end. You will see posters, you can take them. But we, we did, actually, we printed very interesting uh, posters that summarize our activity that you can hang in your classrooms because so that they, the students, and their colleagues can see what we're doing. These posters say, precisely this, namely, we're doing something different. Not different so what, from what it should be, because the eight European skills are a law, are enshrined in the European law of 2007, 2008. So if we say that our objective are eight European skills, we're just complying with the law. If they ask, what you do in the classroom? You do something weird, something strange, there's a bit of confusion, you're talking, you work in teams, how much do they learn? And we say our students learn, they really learn. And they don't have a short-term memory due to passive repetition of content, as Lucan, Mr. Lucangeli said. Because this diktat that we follow is a diktat we have invented. Because the true directions of the Ministry of Education say something different. And also the eight European skills, the European laws say to do some, say we have to do something in our classroom, but only we in the flipped classrooms do it, others don't. I'm not saying that everybody should change from one day to the next, but let us, let them see what we're doing. So I encourage you to take these posters, they're uh, free, you can t pick them up before you go back home. You can choose among three different ones. And if you want to give a donation, a contribution to Flipnet, to the reversed, to the flipped classroom, we cannot cover all expenses also because we have very few sponsors. So you are, are paying with your registration fees, but the costs of this activity, the very high costs, and so if you would like to, you are uh, free to give a donation. You can take away a full box with 15 posters with your donation and you can hang them in your classrooms, in your schools, one per kind. There are five each, five on the eight European skills, eight on uh, the teamwork and eight on the Bloom Pyramid. Also the Bloom Pyramid is a very important thing. If we show, if we make people understand that we make students work on the enhancement of their creativity, the capacity of analysis, of problem-solving skills, and we show them that our students enjoy it because they know that they are useful, they see that they are useful, and so we are strengthened when we go out of the classroom. We are comforted by students who thank us. They don't yawn in other, in other times. They are the they, they used to get bored when I didn't use this method in front of a teacher that is too repetitive, whose goal is just to fill brains with information. Uh, they, they get bored. So I, I just want I'll, I'll, I'll finish right now. I, there, there are scholars here that are more authoritative than me, more knowledgeable in this field. I will. And um, afterwards, there'll be a 
after the contributions, we will hear a video from Paolo Maria Ferri, who sent us a very interesting 15 minutes video, and then there will be other addresses from our guests. Good morning. So, I must say that this recording of Locangeli uh, was very much appreciated because it actually it identified the open wounds in the Italian school. And in fact, I've been thinking now it's 12.25, what is happening in Italian schools, the real school, one that unfortunately we do not see in front of us. I, I taught for 30 years in uh, Italian and history in Italian schools and uh, I uh, daily uh, my work took place in an obsolete um, building and rundown building and in Italian schools at this hour the teacher goes out and the old the new teacher comes in for the next class and this all the students stay in the class and we ask them, sometimes we ask, why don't you go out a moment for a break? And they say, no, we're tired. We're just tired. So we sit here and with all of these teachers talking about strange subjects, uh, I, you know, I need a special permission to go out of the classroom. I'm tired. I want a cigarette. You don't, you know, it's forbidden. You can't smoke today. There's a law. Yes, but I'm tired. Uh, so you enter this classroom after having tried to bring together these 25, 30 students. At a certain point, as a literature teacher, you have to start to talk. So you have to start to talk to these students who are rebels, who don't listen, who are tired. You have to invent something. They're all different. They're all different from each other. There could be uh, one or two people with uh, special problems, disabilities, or some uh, new uh, really arrived immigrants who with poor Italian who don't understand, two or three good students. And so you have to uh, start reading the Malavoglia by Verga, and you have to keep them there, their attention up for one hour. This is Italian school uh, built on the um, alarm, the, the, the bells that separate one class from the other, and then uh, all of a sudden there is a miracle and uh, that you manage to grasp their attention and then the bell rings and this miracle moment uh, disappears and uh, uh, we all understand each other and you know what I'm talking about. It's not easy to change, it's a challenge, it's a difficult challenge. I was listening also to the uh, definition that I've given of the teachers. I will give you three definitions that I gave in the book I wrote, uh, a book dedicated to these uh, students that I was referring to. The teaching, in my opinion, is a specialist of interior adventures, first point. This is something that should be said and explained because teachers are also those that speak with their inner ghosts. So you must always be attentive and balanced. If uh, you make a mistake, so then the class devours you. And uh, then uh, he is uh, the distributor of youth. He distributes uh, uh, cards to young people who are always different, but you are, remain the same. And he is also the artisan of time, because uh, all considered, he has to pass on a tradition of the past to the new generation, pass the baton. And this is actually uh, scary if you consider that you cannot limit yourself just to take like a, a, a parcel from the past and hand it over to the students sitting in front of you. And uh, I, I like the fact that Locangeli mentioned Don, Don Milani saying, I care. You have to ensure that there are cognitive experiences with students. What does this mean? These cognitive experiences. Don Milani had perfectly understood what it was all about in Barbiana. That's what he did. He brought to the class the map of Palestine. He tried to explain to the uh, students, his, his, his small monks, his, his young monks, he tried to explain religion, what religion was. His first students, he taught religion. So, for example, you are explaining 
a poem by Ungaretti to your students, the students who never read a book, oh, never opened a book, never read a novel, they're very hard to manage, very indisciplined, and, but you know that you are losing, you're losing this challenge. But then a magic moment when a student holds up, asks a question, he says, where did he die? Where did Ungaretti die? He died in Milan, he bar was buried in Rome. In that moment, if you miss, if you waste that moment, it was an authentic question. It wasn't just, a, 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 you know, a, a conceited question or a question that was feigned, you know. He, he wants to know. It's his curiosity. He wants to know, so why... Okay, so tomorrow, for example, you could say, let's take a field trip, let's take a bus, let's go to the cemetery, I will show you where Ungaretti died, and so we will really uh, do, put into practice, and we will share, and so you realize when you see that the picture on the, on the coffin, you see that those students aren't only doing a, a school test, they're not making believe that they're listening, but they're actually experiencing an adventure with you, a cognitive experience, a human cognitive experience. So you understand what school is all about. And so, you know, you say, look, so he really lived. Mi lumino di Mansus, famous poem, and it's not just homework. He lived, he died, you see, there he is, there is his, there is a coffin, and so, all of a sudden you see that there is a spark of creativity that was mentioned by by the previous uh, uh, speaker. There was a scientist that penal penalized them in Italian schools. In that moment you realize that those students are working with their own brain. They're, there is a spark of creativity. How can you create a school like this one? You know, this is a big challenge for you. It, it, it's, a, it's a revolution. You have to be aware of this. It means to change a school environment. The school environment isn't a, a closed classroom, and, uh, coercive, and uh, that forces you to stick and seated and listen traditional classrooms with different students, with different ways of seeing their world, with a different mentality compared to their peers of 20 years ago. And they reason in an associative manner, whereas we have a different uh, approach, it's more logical approach, whereas they make, perhaps they make grammar mistakes, and then when you realize that they have creative reactions, there are sparks of genius, and how can you intercept their energy? You have to call yourself into question. That's why I don't like the word method. I like the word spirit. A method can be different, but the spirit must be that of sparking off passions, of triggering the passion of the students. How can you trigger this passion? Well, first of all, we have to be part of the game. We have to realize that, you know, why did we decide to teach? What happened in our personal history? If you carry out this inner uh, uh, process, then you will be facing the classroom in a different way. And they perceive this. They perceive the authenticity of your behavior. So now I'll just the provocation. Even if an old style teacher, completely different from the teacher we are talking about today, uh, somebody, you know, a strict teacher that gives marks on the homework, if he were authentic, if he were sincere in his experience in his class, the students would appreciate him. And I can tell you for sure, based on my 30 year long experience. So what counts is the authenticity of the relationship. That's why I created a school with my wife and many other passionate uh, students, Penny Whirton School, from a great novel by Sil Silvio D'Alzo, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, that is not much known, but an extremely skilled uh, uh, novelist. It is a school for students without uh, register sheets, without books. It's a relationship one-to-one. -one. We have 50 students, 50 teachers that face one another and try to understand who is a Mohammedan immigrant, uh, who is uh, uh, doesn't know how to write, doesn't know Italian, 
and all of these students they understand they realize that this is a free bestowal they realize that you are doing you are not a, a, a the clerk in a a public clerk, but you are actually putting all of your heart in, in what you're doing. And this is the spirit I would like to transfer that we would all want, want to carry out. So just a last remark, these things we cannot, cannot be done on, on our own. A teacher alone cannot uh, bring to completion this idea. We need a group, we need a community, we need the world near us, surround us, must support us. Teachers, teachers today are the only ones in Italy that are trying to bring their students to, to absorb values that are considered anachronistic, that is rigor, concentration. Our students are in a different world. They're, 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 they're directed towards the beauty, towards success. That's what they want. But we have to bring them back to recuperate these uh, basic educational values that will bring them in a different direction. So our work, by paradox, is a, entails a risk because we are the last ones who still embody the limit that these students should respect. And so we need to understand that ours is also an ethical task before in a world that is undergoing a crisis that isn't only economic in nature, it is also deeply spiritual. The schools, the school environment is following a different direction, it's following this uh, uh, quiz-like uh, exams made of, of quizzes as if you were taking your driving license. A multiple choice. If you read uh, The Betrothed, for example, by um, Alessandro Manzioni, if you have a multiple answer question, it's impossible. We want to reduce Italian literature to a multiple question. I mean, the major writer of, of Italian literature, basic pillar, reduced to this. Grazie. Si sente? Sì. Allora, grazie intanto per avermi invitato. Thank you very much. Thank you for having invited me. I'd like to thank Professor Affinati for his speech that I found marvelous. This idea of spirit, spirit that uh, rules, that is more important than a method. And I'm fascinated by that. Now, for the past 17 years, when I was involved with, I was involved, or have been involved with so many teachers. Now, I'm not a teacher myself. I'm a university researcher. I'm involved with new technologies for didactics, and I've been involved with that since I was 17, or actually for 17 years. And in these 17 years, I've met with so many so many teachers that have exactly that spirit that you were talking about. And that spirit is what makes the difference. Now, this... Uh, method, the method that you uh, are involved with, the flipped classroom, is a truly innovative and it makes sense also from a pedagogical point of view. Uh, now, however, aside from the method, uh, the spirit is very important because even if the method were to be different, you would obtain the same things if the spirit were the right one. You are at the forefront, you all who are here today. And why are you at the forefront? Well, because how many of you are flipped to teachers in your own schools? How many of you have that spirit that Eraldo was talking about before? Now, when I say that there is a deep fracture in our schools, I'm not just referring to the fact that the evaluation system is not enough nowadays, but that there is a full-fledged fracture within the schools. Fifteen years ago, there were the first forerunners who were experimenting in new technologies. I myself am involved in didactic technologies. This is the field that I know the best. However, I'm rather convinced that the revolution that you're trying to to bring forth nowadays has to avail itself of technologies. In fact, in many cases, it's thanks to technologies that we were able to change things. The availability, the abundance of technologies is helping us very much. Now, 15 years ago, there were the forerunners. And with people, others instead said that no, they weren't interested, that they were about to retire, and they, wouldn't want, they didn't want to be involved. 
many, uh, however, many forerunners were rather old. Uh, teachers. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, they started embarking on new technologies when they were uh, short of, you know, retiring, despite their age. And all others instead remain instead remained laggards. So this is why I'm saying that you're the f forerunners. Now, today, however, there's a fracture in the schools because you're not able to communicate with these laggards. Because when those laggards come up to you, it's very often just to help them to do something, but they don't want to learn from you. Uh, uh, so at the moment... The school seems not to be inclusive because you are at the top in schools and you have were involved with matters that are so difficult to understand for all others who are lagging behind. Of course, there are then some, uh, some positive cases in which perhaps headmasters uh, can allow these two, uh, these two areas to communicate. Now, the fact that you have created a, an association, the fact that you create an association for, for the practice and research in schooling is fundamental. It's very, very important. I'd like to say that there are not many other instances in Italy of teachers who were able to establish networks of this sort in an effective way. Not many, because in the Politecnico of Milano, for example, we uh, decided very often to create networks uh, revolving around the use of new technologies, but we were never able to do that. The fact that you were able to do that, you were able to talk about these things and to inno innovate in all of these fields, is something that we have to recognize as being very positive. And I hope, in fact, that there will be a further collaboration between you and us, because you are carrying out projects that are not sensational in nature, and they shouldn't be. They have to be daily. They have to be things that are carried out on a daily basis. Uh, you are forerunners, but you should remain forerunners for the future. You have to, uh, you know, help others. Uh, the laggards. Uh, uh, you shouldn't be seen as, you know, points of excellence. Uh, not anymore. You should become the normality. And I believe that the technology can help you from this point of view. So, now, uh, I'd like to lodge a uh, proposal at this point. Now, I thought about three keywords. Three keywords are to go beyond the flipped. Because flipped is something that you have already done. Very well. But then, for the future, what will come? Well, probably many of these things you've already been doing. However, I'd like to insist on some, because perhaps they need to be developed a bit more. Now, before uh, we talked about uh, uh, pedagogists, about chemists, I myself am a pedagogist. I have a degree in philosophy. So the first question is the, con uh, connected to the methodologies. Mm -hmm. Now, so the first keyword for the future is the following, B-Y-O-D, bring your own device. Well, we shouldn't, uh, you know, create excuses that the school doesn't have enough tools, doesn't have computers. No, because we all have uh, tablets, uh, uh, smartphones, very powerful tools that we can use. And of course, this entails a problem in terms of methodology. Why? Well, because in schools, uh, the uh, decision takers are not sufficiently interested in the new technologies, sometimes because they're ignorant or sometimes because they cannot take the right choices. So the decision takers are not sufficiently prepared in new technologies and they take the wrong decisions. And I'm sorry to say that, but in the past few years I've seen that the, the wrong decisions were taken also when purchasing uh, some tools. So there's no culture in terms of the uh, proper design uh, of curricula. And the fact that sometimes we're not able even to communicate adequately with headmasters uh, makes the problem even worse. So how can you, we overcome this problem? Well, if we, we can solve it, if we try to promote interoperability, if we try not to be locked in to only one tool, and if we try to promote this concept, the concept of the BYOD, of, the own devices. Now, I believe that the time is mature for all of that. Secondly, 
Now, when you uh, teach in a flipped way, you will see that the ratio between formal, non-formal, uh, uh, informal and social uh, uh, teaching changes, changes radically. Now, in your classrooms, those classrooms where you work differently, learning is much more socially oriented, uh, much more than formal, and uh, therefore... Uh, the needs uh, are uh, considered much more. Now, this slide was taken from uh, a teacher, uh, a professor in management, Joaquin Stroh, uh, United States, from the United States, and he says that social learning is much like the beverages machine. It provides you with the coffee that you want in that moment. Then, secondly, something that I was talking about during the coffee break. At this moment, we're radically changing also the milieu, the environment in which we learn. And as an expert in technology who is involved with platforms, this means that the scenario itself is changing, i.e. that many activities are carried out after school, out of school, out of the platforms, the de dedicated platforms. In personal learning the platforms, for example, as uh, Mario Rotta called them. This is fundamental. Now, the other two key words are MOOC and English. Why? Well, because the teachers, uh, among the many tasks, today is also to be viewed as an e-broker, uh, a learn broker. He is the person who has to choose among the plethora of material that is available in the world, that material which is helpful to teach something. Now, I've, uh, I was very interested in the, that data bank that you've uh, been building, because one of the great mistakes that we make in all schools, even in universities, is that we don't uh, exploit sufficiently the free of charge material that is already available. Why should I explain something which was uh, perhaps already explained very well in a video? So I'd, I'd prefer to just show that video and then comment that video with uh, my students. So the teacher has to have that critical ability to choose the right material in the right moment. Now, nowadays, uh, uh, child, uh, your students are called uh, digital natives, of course. This is a word, however, that I don't like very much. However, this critical attitude is not something that uh, they uh, uh, that they have in themselves. They have to learn it. We have to help them to develop that. And the teacher, the broker teacher, the learner broker, has to help them out in, to do that. So he chooses the material and he creates a personalized path for his or her own students and that's very important. The other key word is English. We shouldn't be afraid by English. Uh, if we consider the material that exists in Italian language, it's very, very uh, little. It's a drop in the ocean. The ocean is Engli in English. Now, I didn't do Erasmus at university many years ago because I didn't l know any English at all. However, I decided to learn it when I was an adult. Uh, I decided to understand uh, what others were telling me in a different language because I thought that was important. We shouldn't fear learning uh, new languages, learning English. Then, one other thing, I believe and firmly conf convinced that when we uh, promote these flipped classrooms, uh, and the uh, relationship between prescriptive and emergent learning changes radically. Now, what are those two learnings? Well, prescriptive learning it means that I know what I'm teaching and I am aware of the outcome that I'd like to obtain. I can foresee it. I already know it. So I know that if I'm teaching something to uh, a student, uh, at the end, uh, that student should know X. So, I'm reading the Promessi Sposi and uh, that student has to answer that question on Donna Bondo. Emergent learning, instead of something completely different, I cannot foresee things because if, if I use it and if I allow the discussion to emerge, then perhaps some aspects will crop up, which I didn't think about. For example, in Ungheretti, uh, I didn't think about showing people the tomb of Ungheretti. It came up from the students themselves. And that's very important because at this point, however, we also have an, a problem in terms of evaluation because in the prescriptive, there is a duality between the right and wrong answer. In the emergent, instead, I can only 
work a posteriori and evalu- exposed to evaluate if there is a congruence, if, there, uh, if the answer is congruent with the question. So the suggestions are the following. Uh, are, they're based with the years and years of experience in the field and with so many things that I've uh, talked about with the teachers. Now, I'm, teacher, I'm not a teacher myself. Uh, however, I try to interact continuously with teachers at schools and visit schools uh, to understand the real things that happened there. Now, I'm not a teacher myself, uh, but I'm um, a son of an elementary school teacher and my wife uh, is a high school teacher. So. So when we work with emergent learning, we can try to do the following things. To create uh, uh, negative constraints, i.e. we can say, we can reach this point, but then there is a boundary that we have to keep within. Then a constant and continuous monitoring, but this we already do. And also measure the resilience rather than the strength. Uh, We have to be able to react. Uh, So uh, flipping, of course, uh, is inevitable. It's very important. And I'd like this afternoon, for example, to discuss about this with you, also informally, to ask you how you do all of this flipping. Because I'm not very sure about that. I'd like to learn something more. Now, today, we can learn everything, almost everything, in... uh, a semi-autonomous way, almost everything. However, our responsibility is the following. We need to teach students to learn a critical approach. And when I talk about critical, I'm referring to that term in connection to Kant, what Kant says, as an example, the boundaries, the possibilities, and the orientation that I have to take. Because otherwise, uh, you know, just searching for something on Google is not something that is simple at all. It doesn't come natural. Now, I've been involved in this field for 17 years, and at the moment I'm following a MOOC for Google, in Google to become a power searcher for Google. And I'm discovering so many things free of charge. <laughs> so if you're interested in that, just you know, look up a power searcher in Google. Uh, so this is something they have to teach your students. You have to instill in your in your students because uh, the first the, uh, result is Wikipedia. You answer the second result, and that's a little bit you know a little bit more shaky than Wikipedia. But I have to teach the students uh, the hierarchy of sources. You know to teach them what the best ones are. Then in terms also of uh, formation, the formation of teachers. Now you're doing that autonomously on your own, but also in a very connected way with networks and also in a more formal way with courses. However, you always have to consider the a model that I'm showing there, which uh, uh, of that author, which uh, you should be aware of, i.e. that when you use technologies, uh, you have to use, you put together knowledge, pedagogy, technology, and content together. However, uh, this knowledge very often is not in the minds of just one teacher. Uh, so that teacher needs to allow those n- knowledges to flow, to come from the f- different actors. For example, people from the school or outside of schools, etc. These should act as facilitators. And then also uh, ongoing training, uh, uh, continuous uh, uh, training for t- teachers. This is very important. We have a MOOC. For example, there's a, a MOOC for flipped classrooms at this moment. Now, now, to teach geography, for example, we're creating some systems aimed at uh, elementary school children. We create an experimental one for just one classroom, and on the 4th of March there will be another one that will be launched, which will involve 200 uh, children, uh, which will employ the Umapaton. Do you know what it is, the Umapaton? Well, I'd like to talk about it then, briefly. Now, maybe you're not aware of it, but there are some places in the world where we don't have maps of. Why? For various reasons. For humanitarian ones, especially. For example, perhaps there was some, you know, social or natural upheavals. And we don't have maps. There are aerial pictures, but we don't have maps. So, the Mapaton is the following. It's an activity which takes place all together. So, all people take those aerial pictures and say that there is a home, that there is a road, and create these maps on the open street map. So it's an open source system. And at that point onwards, these new maps are created. So the ONGs, the non-governmental organizations, are asking for volunteers, are asking help to volunteers. 
For example, we did this for Swaziland, and that's cool. The king of Swaziland decided to eradicate malaria from his country, but he didn't have a map of all of the homes in his country, so we decided to start this work, to do this work for him. And in the Politecnico, there are some specialists in geography, so I involved them, and they involved uh, children from elementary schools. This was never done before, not even in the United States, where this type of system was adopted first. Uh, and the results we obtained were following. In only two hours, we were able to map 1,400 buildings. Incredible. And also that... Uh, in the end, I came up with a feedback questionnaire for these children, and I understood from those children that they had a very deep knowledge over what it meant to create those maps, over why it was so important to create them, because those maps did not exist naturally and had to be created by a human hand. So, at that point, the teacher, the geography teacher, of course, can expand on all of this to teach them other things. So, in closing, if you follow this approach, the flipped approach, after the flip approach, you can continue forward. Uh, however, with a caveat, you have to continue to, uh, you know, uh, self, uh, uh, self questioning yourself, and uh, trying to be al always inquisitive, and not rest on laurels, and not at any time say that you're the best teacher, because you have to be aware that you know that you do not know. Se, se, se sono stato bravo a temporizzarle sul if I was on time if I was able to upload everything on time you'll already find the slides on my blog maybe we should comment on this but unfortunately we don't have time so I would like each one of you to reflect on what has been said and I will immediately give the floor to Paolo Ferri Otherwise, we won't finish on time. It's important that everybody speaks. So it's very important that somebody is writing questions on Facebook. It's uh, uh, very good. Just Marella, she says, what can we do with the strict teachers who are resistant to change? What po road can be undertaken to ensure that they convert to inclusive uh, didactics and inclusive uh, teaching? Well, it's a difficult question if the if the matter is, is that of triggering passion, well, then it's, these are two questions. Let's listen to Paolo Ferri, and then we will try to comment even the last question. <clears throat> Dear colleagues, this time I'm uh, not uh, speaking uh, personally, but virtually. Uh, fortunately, I had to be in Milan today. However, I, I still, it was important for me to give this contribution to the round table to which I was invited by Stefano Maglioni, a video contribution since we're talking about new technologies. And I think that the, <clears throat> the theme raised by Maurizio Maglioni is a radical, is a fundamental theme. How can we transform a school that is still at 85, 90% is, is a school made of theoretical knowledge, of a bo paper books, about you know the traditional setting of learning. So how can we transform all of this in a flipped class classroom? This is a radical question that, uh, of course, does not envisage one single answer. However, I will try to reason on two different planes. First of all, I think that this year the climate compared to last year has changed, meaning uh, there are significant uh, legislative intervention like the national uh, digital plan uh, uh, policy uh, policies that um, for which we can be a little bit optimistic. And the second plane is uh, to look at the state of the art of our uh, pro the progress made uh, in this field and focus on innovation. As relates to the first aspect, 
I think we should give a positive assessment of the intellectual investment and financial investment of the national plan on the digital school. That is a direct application of law 107 enacted by the government. Uh, I invite you to read this document. It's very well done. And of course, it gives a, a dignity to a legislation that was lacking. And in fact, it reaffirms fundamental projects like investment in uh, investment in physical persons and not on machines to work on methodology and not on hardware. the broadband uh, cabling of all schools by 2020. And this is sustained also by a consistent investment. So we're talking about uh, about 1 billion euro package uh, for schools for the next four year period. So this also recognizes the importance of uh, this uh, project of digital investment, of the digital uh, processes. Uh, but however, uh, digital education involves technology. So from this uh, perspective, uh, this aspect, this data has already has been acknowledged. And I hope that, uh, as in the past, it will. This money won't be used only for creating new classrooms uh, that will remain empty, but rather will be and will not be used for traditional uh, teaching. So. Also, for this reason, I think it's very useful, for example, the establishment of a digital animator, this uh, figure with uh, um, that is not, however, recognized economically. However, his role is recognized uh, uh, because he has to cooperate with uh, the uh, school headmaster also for the coordination of all projects, innovation projects. So I think this is an opportunity that should be seized for all of you who are digital animators. So I think from this uh, perspective compared to the past, uh, we can be more optimistic uh, there, since we have the resources that have already been allocated. I think about the call, the bid on uh, new laboratories, innovative uh, teaching uh, tools, and also training, training of uh, digital animators. These are small steps, however, it's a reverse of a trend uh, and four billion on the whole, a four billion uh, package for the uh, schools compared to the four billion cuts of the previous uh, and the, go uh, the government administration. So I think from this uh, uh, perspective, I think there are reasons for uh, hope, the elements of innovation. And uh, of course, there are also, uh, there's also the other side of the coin, that is, there's some risks. And uh, uh, we're talking about other projects in the northern center of, of Italy. And also the fact of not rationalizing and implementing a set of uh, training activities with risk of dispersion. However, I think that uh, it is gra we are gradually meeting the challenge of this new legislation that is finally being uh, concretized, thereby put translating into concrete action things we had only been talking about uh, um, and also creating an entire system uh, to this regard at national level. Of course, it has to be uh, done uh, on in the, considering the long term. Uh, so, as I said, I think that both the uh, reforms and also uh, the new document on the digital, digital school and the investments made on the virtual learning environment, on the appointment, for example, of new digital animators, and uh, thus uh, also uh, training, individual training uh, to spread the learning and the skills on this new machinery. I think it is a success. 
and of uh, recognizing the figure of uh, innov new innovators. And uh, so I think we can be quite satisfied. There is also the plane of, as I said, the second point of my address, the plane of the state of the art. So what is the current stage of innovative technologies uh, as relates to teaching and uh, what are the next steps, at what point are we at. So I think we can adopt an approach that uh, uh, they, that should take into account a set of critical aspects, meaning that in, um, rec recently we are using this reversed Access this is uh, the flipped classroom that risks containing everything and nothing at the same time. In, in other words, it is evident that you can uh, carry out a traditional, uh, there can be a traditional classroom even in a flipped classroom, but if for there to be a truly innovative classroom, it has to be integrated with uh, online tools and uh, with a digital classroom that will strengthen the role of the teacher in the traditional classroom. This is a fundamental aspect in the real classroom. So I think we, all of us should follow this path, should encourage the continuation of this path at both the uses the producers of electronic registers, infrastructures, and digital equipment for a school must understand the role of uh, virtual uh, learning environments in schools <coughs> is a very important aspect. Evidently, evidently, there cannot be a flipped classroom without an appropriate learning environment for us. Sometimes we take it for granted, but as I have seen in various schools in Italy, this aspect is often um, undervalued and also um, the appropriate software for the management and for the implementation of, uh, of uh, these uh, tools is often uh, uh, given a secondary role. So I think this is an aspect that on which we have to focus our reflections and also the innovators must put pressure on this as aspect uh, in their relations, in their communication with the school staff and all the other stakeholders involved. In particular with publishers, I think we should all uh, carry out uh, counseling activities. We cannot expect that all schools will use the same platform of the same publisher. And here, the indications of a national digital school plan, there must be interactive tools that can be shared because the environment should be a virtual environment of school. It cannot uh, be uh, the digital environment of uh, uh, the publisher and uh, it must be one single digital environment. Uh, so of course we have to optimize this service, this uh, innovative tool. So we must remember that flipping the class is not only physical action, but also in terms of software, open software for the fruition and the planning of uh, these uh, of these tools. The second uh, aspect in terms of methodology, because of flipper, so that the word flipper classroom is not just an empty container, is the idea that you need a solid didactic planning approach in the creation of the concrete activities that students are called to follow, to carry out. They are the active protagonists of this uh, project. So a large part of uh, the learning tools can be put online within an, a virtual environment, but it in class, in the classroom, one should not work traditionally. So it should be a two-track approach, creating a set of grids of activity and work ever more interesting, ever more um, innovative to be shared with the entire school community. So I think this requires, on the part of the experts in this field, 
uh, uh, methodological reflection and also in terms of uh, uh, training of our colleagues. And so I think the departments in this, uh, of, the, uh, of the various schools uh, play a major role. And I think that the activities and uh, the creation of these kinds of activities, one of the major challenges of uh, the school activity and um, we, as teachers, we have a great responsibility. So this should be the result, uh, in-depth reflection should be made on these uh, subjects in order to become, uh, have a, to perfection this role. I think there are a lot of work needs to be done, a lot of training, methodological training, and methodological education that will be implemented in the following years uh, with uh, the uh, dedicated uh, funds. So we have to reason on the entire approach, a methodology, and also to highlight the fruition on the part of these tools on the part of this of these tools on the part of the students and the role of the teachers. And the third aspect regards the epistemology that underlies this uh, approach. In our school, we propose the idea that the classroom should actually be a scientific la laboratory highlighted with the digital contribution, with the digital tools. And of course, sciences as a whole, as a subject, and the science as a container that includes many other subjects, that includes Latin, for example, that includes physics, biology, and maths uh, need to be hi highlighted. However, the methods method is important, the activities that the students are called to carry out, along with the activities that we as teachers are called to carry out, have to be activities based on a rigorous methodology. And they have to be public activities, visible to everyone, that can be viewed several times, and uh, using the uh, criteria of a modern science. So this, this feature of rigor that will characterize, should characterize uh, the didactive approach in flipped classroom is an aspect we should all take into account and that has to be a priority for all of us. Otherwise, we will be exposed to the risk that uh, team, some people might say that the teamwork is a waste of time, so we should not uh, make this happen. We should not uh, give reasons for these ideas to be uh, developed. Uh, of course, the activities have to be follow a rigorous approach. I know that watching a video can be boring. So I will reach a conclusion as react related to aspect the state of the art from the legislative uh, uh, perspective. I think a lot of progress has been made, and uh, a large part of the activity of innovation that we have carried out has been received also at government level or at least at the technical level. And uh, I think this is a great result that we achieved. It is equally necessary to carry out an in-depth reflection on a methodological reflection linked to the planning of the activities, uh, the founding principles of all the of all the subjects, and also relating to. Uh, reducing the subject to 8, 10 per year. And so the part, school department plays a major role. And we must also avoid the risks that are linked to, to all reforms. For example, the educational training uh, uh, goals of the teachers shouldn't be managed only by 
uh, certain organizations, as sometimes happens. In other words, we need to carry out an active citizenship uh, uh, function in terms of uh, contributing uh, to sustaining and to furthering this transformation. It won't be a speedy transformation as innovators. We know that we are a minority and however, precisely for this reason, we have to extend our networks given this new scenario to seize an occasion, perhaps the last occasion of the public school to reach a level of the more advanced uh, school systems in the world. Uh, thank you very much, and I apologize for not being with you physically today. Now we only have five minutes left. Any questions? Quickly, please. Yes, in the meantime, the video of Professor Ferri went out. Now, uh, while I was, uh, while the video was on, there were some of us who were making some comments. Paola Arduini, for example, Paola Arduini, she made a very interesting question in connection to the digital plan for schools, i.e. the role of uh, Flip to school teachers, their role as to the digital plan for schools. What, what's their, their role? Now, uh, we post, however, if you want to make other questions, you can make questions on Facebook, uh, and uh, the professor, of course, will answer directly there if you have other questions. And the same is true also for Daniela Lucangeli. If you have questions, we, can, we will, uh, we will uh, submit them to her. So. Are there any questions now, however, either on these last speeches or perhaps also on the previous ones? Now, just a short remark. The national plan for digitalization, in my opinion, provides a precious opportunity. And we have to try to make the most of it, however. Of course, it's not enough. We need much more. However, it's a first step. And we have to try to exploit it as much as possible. However, I'm a bit wary, skeptic as to that concept of the so-called the digital champion, because what I learned throughout years is uh, that those uh, digital champions uh, are very, very difficult to find. Uh, now, uh, is it just a? Uh, uh, a role that is taken on by somebody, a role that is very difficult, because if it's so difficult, it would be very difficult for people to actually take on that role, to become digital cha champions. Well, I have some doubts, at, in fact, at the moment, and I haven't understood why the ministry did not come up with some circular letters over the role, not so much over the role of the digital animators, as they're called, or rather but rather over their competences over what they should do so i'm a bit cautious as to these digital champions and it's also not clear how these digital champions will will be actually paid within schools and i'm i'm i apologize for being so blunt but uh, I'm, I'm not sure from, from where we'll get the money from and then furthermore the ministry is being beat beating around the bush a little bit too much over these, this digital champion. Then, as Aldo says, uh, despite all of this, it's an opportunity that, needs to, that we need to seize. Now, I myself uh, am not a digital champion. Uh, however, I was involved in my school to provide some support to our digital champion within our schools, our school. So I've taken on a, an active role in the school. Uh, I'm not paid for that help that I'm provided, but I'm not interested in that at all because I, otherwise I've never become, I'd never have become a flipped uh, teacher or, as a matter of fact, a teacher, too cool. I'd ch have chosen another job if I wanted money, only money. So, getting back to what Paola said before, that digital champion needs to be well integrated with the rest of what is happening in school. They have to be at the first line 
to allow for a proper dissemination of ideas within the school and, w and which of course not necessarily you know the flip chap uh, classroom but they have to promote a different didactics which is more in tune with the, the students with our students of today very well now there's uh, another question that we need to uh, answer a lingering question now we have to you know promote the spirit we have to set passions ablaze and that's very important we of course a technology can be employed to actually raise passions you know, our website, for example, that was uh, translated in so many languages, there are students uh, from uh, the Philippines or from Albania who can read all of those things in, our, in their own languages, and that's very important. But we also have to try to avert some risks, i.e. the risk of uh, making technology too cold and uh, thereby, you know, setting off putting off path the passion, the fire of passion. Well, I'd answer to this question with uh, what Don Milani said when uh, he was asked, uh, what should we do in schools? And Don Milani said, or answered in the following way, in a very important way. The question is wrong, he said. You shouldn't ask what we should do in schools, but how we should be in schools. This is the true question. So how should we be in our schools? That's why before I was talking about the spirit and not about methods. Well, how should we be? We have to find that spark, which is personal, because we are all involved, uh, we're all involved with our own sensitivity, or our culture, our character, and we have to also try to do something else however we have to involve our colleagues the ones that perhaps are less involved in all of this who are perhaps a bit more you know trying not to be involved with it we have to try to involve them more how by subverting things now you uh, who are involved with the flip classrooms of course uh, like subversion very much and, and I'd like to make an example of that yesterday there were some uh, uh, Egyptian students very difficult to manage uh, even one-to-one -one. and uh, these Egyptian uh, students uh, were completely in uh, not uh, not apt at all to 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 learning in a classroom so what did I do? Well, there were two Italian school, uh, uh, two Italian uh, high school students that were involved with the program in order to carry out a, a, a to take part in a project. So, so I was helped by these two high school uh, students, and I asked those two high school students, "Why don't you help me out? Why don't you take charge of those four fellow students from Egypt?" And those two high school students, in fact, helped me. I brought them to the class, and uh, they uh, helped me out. So, 16-year-olds who were teaching 12-year-olds, uh, that's what was happening. So, these two high school students, Italian, with exercises, with books, with things to do, with three, four students of the same of the same age in that case now they didn't uh, know Italian and I saw them writing uh, in the opposite direction in, in Arab so we started with you know with images pictures because we couldn't use words so the two Italian students high school students were talking with their peers Egyptian students as they would never have done if they were to just meet them uh, by chance on the street so in human work took place there and that's what, what I mean when I talk about flipping things this is what we have to try to do we have to try to do to do things 
differently, in a new way, because schools nowadays uh, act uh, as a glue for all that is being done in Europe. This is a human work that we have to do not only with immigrants, of course, but also with our stu own students, who sometimes are even more foreign than uh, those who come from abroad, sometimes, if we don't involve them properly. So, uh, this is what we have to do. We have to involve them and also teachers, because otherwise the school, otherwise the school will remain exactly as it stands, uh, with... Uh, uh, with uh, very little inno innovation taking place, with just an evaluation taking place at the end uh, of a term when teachers meet and decide uh, who uh, has to pass on to the next year and who has to be flunked. Good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon. We devoted the morning session speaking with people who work in the uh, flipped classroom in Italian this afternoon. We will focus on trying to understand how the flipped classroom is used also abroad. Because, in fact, as in the beginning, we copied a little bit, as to say, from the British. We have a British teacher here with us, Russell Stenner, who uh, taught until a few years ago in a school, and now he works full time in the training of uh, teachers. He is a person distant from me at the end of uh, the hall of this this here near us. So then there is a professor from the University uh, of La Rioja near Pamplona, the city of Pamplona. And he will explain how he used the flipped classroom near me, Louise Dufour, a teacher, a French teacher from Paris, who is also a full-time teacher, two teachers, and he will also t tell us uh, about uh, what they do in France. So three different experiences from three different countries, England, France, and Spain. So we can try to learn more about what they do, how they do it, to see whether we are in line. Maybe in England they are more advanced than us, so maybe we can learn something new for the future. And to conclude, in a flipped way, my presentation, I am Fabio Biscaro, that uh, I wrote uh, with Maurizio, the, uplift, the uh, flipped classroom. Now I give the floor to Eloise, who will talk to us about the flipped classroom in uh, Paris. Thank you, Fabio. Be able to say mi dispiace, non parlo italiano, and that's to say I'm um, sorry, I won't speak Italian. I have no idea what you said, but uh, I trust you. I so, said you three are great. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I uh, I was asked to give you like a, a French point of view of the on the flipped classroom, what's happening in France, what are the practices that are developing, and uh, and how are things going. So first, I'm going to start by telling you like, where all this comes from, uh, from my part. So in 2012, I was a, a biologist. I, uh, I have a PhD in biology. I was doing research at the University of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. I was also teaching uh, for uh, students. And, uh, and I came across the flip classroom. It was. At that time, uh, I didn't know it by this name, but uh, there was a, a professor at the university who was using what he was calling like a reverse classroom, which is basically the flipped classroom. And, uh, and so I felt that it was interested, interesting, and so I started um, well, documenting it first for my own practice because I felt that uh, this could be interesting. You know, when you when you have like 200 students in front of you, you wonder how you can put them in activity, and 
And then the more, the more I interviewed people who are practicing the flip classroom, like middle school or high school or university, uh, the more I felt it was interesting. So I, I also went to, uh, to FlipCon, so the, the American meeting for the flip classroom. And, uh, and I felt that it was really, the flip classroom was actually really a good vector to change education, but not like to completely change it, like for something novel, but just to spread practices that had been, long, that had been known for long, but that were not uh, really much used. So, so I put here a few, uh, a few people who really developed and, and studied concepts that are really at the core of the flipped classroom, collaboration between students, having the, the students active, these kind of things. And so, of course, people will say, yes, yeah, so this has been known for a, for a while. Uh, and so there are already people doing it, you know, placing students at the center of the, at the, at the learning, giving them charge of their, of their learning. Yes, but at least in France, I don't know how it is here, but at least in France, whenever you go to a, to a school and you open the door of a classroom, what you find are tables that are in line. How collaborative is that? So, of course, you can do work by, by, uh, with two students and so on, but for me, this is a marker of something that is not that collaborative. I've been in many other classrooms since, and I've been in classrooms that don't look the same at all. And so, the, I really do think that, again, that the flipped classroom, it's actually a vector, a vector to bring people to those kind of, uh, to, to those kind of practices, and for many reasons. Uh, the first one, and here I just took the, uh, I, I just took uh, what uh, what E. M. Rogers uh, said are you know helpers to diffuse an innovation, and what helps diffusing an innovation. So the first thing is the relative advantage, and so. No, if somebody help you. I will just replay it. The the relative advantage. It's the fact that when I ask people, would you go back, when you've tried flipping, would you go back to a different, like your previous, the previous way that you were teaching? This is the kind of comments that I get. No. If somebody held a gun to my head, I don't even know if I would do it then. So, I don't know if you heard, but the guy said, if, if some, even if somebody would put a gun to my head, I don't know if I would do it. Well, of course, he's American, so he's emphasizing everything that he's saying. But it was still the same comment. We've, did, we've, did, we've done recently uh, a study, and like 98% of the, of the teachers who tried flipping, they keep going. And it's a small study, it's in France, but the numbers are the same, for example, in the, in the US. The second advantage is compatibility because where in France we have a system where there are certain things that you can do as a teacher and certain, thi certain things that you cannot do. And so certain, thi certain things are decided by the state and for some things you have the freedom. And the thing is that first, you know that when the Ministry of Education decides something and in, in her office uh, it looks in a certain way it doesn't mean at all that it's going to be exactly the same thing that is going to happen in the classrooms because everyone adapts it. And the second is that every time this happens, that there is a decision that is made at the top of the institution, this is what happens. Huge demonstration, nobody agrees, and it's a, it's a big mess. And so it's really difficult to change an institution. But the advantage of a free classroom is that as a teacher, you decide in your own classroom whether you want to use it or not. And in French, it's called the, the freedom, the pedagogical freedom. So you have the freedom to decide how you're going to teach. You have to teach some things, but you decide how you're going to teach it. So the third is that it's a, initially, it's a simple concept, and 
it seems that it's easy to use. You can just take some of the some of the of the lecture and put it at home, and that seems easy. And we'll see we'll see later that there actually and you know that there's actually so much more to it. And of course, you can try it, but not not change everything at once, and and you have an observable outcome. So you see immediately whether it works or not. And so. Is that a revolution? I don't think it's a, it's a pedagogical revolution. Again, those are principles that have been known for a while. But what changes with the flipped classroom is really the fact that it's a grassroots movement and so that the teachers themselves are adhering to it and deciding to, to use it because it's attractive, because it solves the problem that every teacher has. How can I spend more time with my students? And so it's really, it's really a movement that empowers teachers. And so this is, this is what, the, what it really brings to the table, this idea that you have something really diffusible to diffuse things that we know are working. So again, I, uh, I was in the US, I discovered that, I interviewed many people, and so I, uh, I came back to France in 2013, and I thought first what we need to do is that we need to spread the idea, because at that time, not that many people had heard about it, and so the, the association that, uh, that I founded and that I preside now, Inversion La Classe, where we keep documenting uh, the different practices, we publicize it, so we make sure that the information is available, and also, very important, as uh, you are doing here, uh, we, facilitate ex we facilitate exchanges between, uh, in the community because people need to exchange about their practices in order to make sure that all the teachers know what it is. The idea is not for us to push them to use the flipped classroom, but just to make sure that they know what it is and that they have resources if they want to, if they want to use it. To, to start using it. And so a few of the things that we're doing is that we have, a, for example, we have a huge community, huge, we have a big community on Twitter. And so twice a month, there is a discussion on Twitter on a specific theme. We, as, uh, as we're doing here, we organized the, the first uh, French meeting uh, on the subject uh, last July. And uh, for us, it was really important that people would share their practices. So there were actually like five sessions in parallel so that teachers from all over France and also uh, elsewhere were presenting what they were doing. And not only presenting like, I know and I'm going to teach you, but since it's, it was uh, about the flipped classroom, the idea was it was supposed to be collaborative. And so that people were showing what they were doing, but there were also people in the in the room who could say, but I'm regarding this, I'm doing that, and, uh, and discussing. And we also organized, like just at the end of this January, the, the first uh, week of the flip classroom. And, uh, and I very much hope that, uh, that you're gonna do one day. Uh, it's the, the idea is again to facilitate the relationship between the teachers who are interested and who want to know more about it or share practices. So we did two things. We told, okay, flippers, people who are practicing the flip classroom, open your classrooms to other people who are interested. And so for that, they just have to ask like the, the, chief, of the, the chief of the school, okay, can I have you know, foreigners in my, in my classroom? And, uh, and then we put them on the map. And so what you see here is the map of what happened for the week of the flipped classroom. And also we said, okay, everyone who wants to do a seminar during that week, again, we'll put you on the map so that it's much easier to publicize and, to, um, and for people to find somewhere, somewhere uh, next to their place where, where they can find and go talk to people who are doing it. And we'll do it again next year. And I hope that many countries will do it also. And I really encourage you to do it because it worked like really well. Um, so this is what we do. So back to 
what is the state of the flipped classroom in France? So this uh, is a map of the people that we could locate, so meaning that they're active on uh, social networks, that they're visible on the web, I mean that they make themselves visible in uh, February 2014. So there weren't many people. As I told you, even if you do like a Google Trends, you can see that until the end of 2013, you can't even find the word, so in French it's classe inversée, you can't even find the, the word in Google. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but it's not, it's not really detectable, it's not significant. And so this is uh, one year after, and you see that already it, uh, it's blossoming. And, uh, and this year we haven't done it yet because we have too many people, and so we have to do it, but we just didn't have time. And, uh, and we expect that this represents something like 10% of the people who are actually flipping. And so, okay, so you have all those people flipping, and we've talked about the flipped classroom, but there are obviously flipped classrooms. There is not the or the flipped classroom, like the, the dogma, the, the magical dogma that solves all the problem. There is a gradient of practices because this is, this is the, the power of the flip classroom, is that you adapt, you adapt it to what you want to do. So I'm going to present you uh, a few examples of what is done in France, and I'm sure you would find equivalent here. Uh, and so for the sake of, of clarity, uh, I like to classify it into three kinds of flipped classrooms. And again, this is a continuum. This is really, this is really a gradient. It, those are not like closed boxes and you're either in one or the other and there is no communication between the two. So the axis that I find the most um, useful to, to classify them is the, the level of the student's autonomy. So I would say that in the first, in the first kind, the students are actors of their learning. So this is like the, 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 child, the poster child of the flipped classroom. You put the lecture at home and you do more activities in class. Really, lecture at home and more activities in class. And so the, the student has time, decides, when he's, gonna, when he's gonna look at the lecture, so already he's actor, he's taking control of the learning path. But then you can have like other variations. I'm gonna talk about it. Then for me, the second type is when you, when you improve, when you increase, again, the student's autonomy to, to a point where he's a producer. Like you don't provide the student with lectures because the student is actually making the lecture and producing the, his own content. And then the, the, the third, a third type would be when you have even more autonomy for the student because he's actually not only taking control of the learning path, not only building his or her own knowledge, but he's building his own learning path. Meaning that the, the teacher doesn't provide the learning path anymore, the student makes it himself. So I'm going to take examples so that it, it will be a little bit more clear, maybe. So here is one example of, um, of uh, what I would call type one, where the students are actors and taking control of their learning path. So this is the example of uh, Geoffroy Laboudigue. Geoffroy Laboudigue is here with a very French name. Uh, and so what he does is that before, before the, so he's a mathematics teacher uh, in, the, in middle school. So what he does is that before, before the students come to class, they have a very short video, like one minute, uh, one minute, which really gives a tiny, um, some elements of the lecture, but it's really a, a small part of the lecture. And then he gives them something like this, which is the learning path so that each student, when they come, they have the learning path, and so they read and they follow the path. So they, so they did a little form before they come to class, so they have an idea of how, how good they are feeling about the, about the notion. Do they feel at ease, not at ease? And so this is the question here. Like, do you feel at ease? So here it's a mathematical theorem. Um, 
I don't know how to pronounce in English, it's a talus, anyway. And so do you feel at ease? Well, if they do, they can follow one path. I don't know if you see, you don't see my, uh, my pointer. So, on the left, on the left, if you're at ease, they have a QR code, and so the QR code brings them to uh, another to another video with uh, more more um, uh, details, and then uh, they have objectives that are listed, and uh, with the uh, with the uh, different exercises that they have to do, and the little boxes are to check, or uh, is it done well or not, or should you redo it, so that they can redo the exercises as long as they don't feel uh, comfortable with it. And if they're not comfortable, then they are, they are sent to another path, which takes into account the problem that they have. And then when they have done that, they can go to the, to the second level, and then at the bottom of the page, you can see a, like a, a second level of differentiation that if they, again, if the, the students who are better and who have mastered it faster, they arrive, they have, they have another level that they, that they can reach. So this is one example where you have actually, you know, the information, the students access it when they need it. So they have a little bit before the classroom, which is accessible for everyone, but otherwise, like during the class, it's accessible when they need it. Uh, an example of type two, when I would say the students are producer and produce their own knowledge. Uh, this is uh, an example taken from the work of David Bouchillon. He's a, a history and geography teacher. He used to be in middle school, now he's in high school. And so what he does is that he gives a complex task to his students. So I don't know if he translates well. Can you, can you raise your hand if you know what, uh, or if it makes sense for you, what a complex task is? Okay. So the complex task, it's, uh, basically it's a task that will, that will mobilize a lot, uh, a lot of information and skills. And so that you are given the task and you have, to, you have yourself to mobilize everything that you're gonna do. So an example, I think it's best told by, the, by an example, is that here they're working on totalism and so Roosevelt needs you. Uh, you're in December 1938 since the, the American ambassador in Berlin uh, left in November 1936, blah, 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 um, blah, blah, blah. You need to write a note to Roosevelt and to counsel him whether or not he should enter war or not. And then uh, he gives a list, he gives a list of documents. This is quite complex because he gives a list of documents, but so the students have to produce at the end basically something that sums it up that sums it up. And so this is this is what we call like in French a uh, complex task. And so he adds another another layer to it, which is the differentiation. Because this is, since this is a complex task, there are students who are going to be able to do it like this, and there are students who are going to, who are, for who it's going to be more difficult. And so for them, there are, there are several, again, several paths, as I would say, with more, and it's more structured. So for the, for the students who have more difficulties, they, it is structured, like for example, first, like uh, make a schematic about what you understand about this and this document, and they have, there are intermediate questions. Uh, another example of uh, this kind of, uh, of use of the complex task and making students producers of their, uh, of their knowledge is uh, Marie Soulier. So she's a French teacher in middle school, and she has a very structured flipped classroom. So there is the beginning at the bottom, and then there are steps. And like all of her uh, classroom periods go like this. So first, she gives uh, a little video to watch at home, but it's an appetizer. She calls it really, literally an appetizer. Uh, and so, well, actually, So the day before, she gives them the, a video, and so, but what is that video? It's an appetizer. It's a very short video, which is not a lecture, but it's just like a teaser. 
really a teaser, an appetizer. And so what is a good recipe for, a, for an appetizer? A good dose of imagination, lots of examples. Don't say too much and just question the student. And, uh, and then on the day, uh, they, uh, it starts with uh, the people who watch the, the students who watch the, the video, they discuss between themselves what they understood. The, the ones that are not that sure about what they saw, what it is about, they can join the table of the curious minds. So it's not that they didn't understand, they are curious, and then she spent time with them. And so that it means that the tables and the groups, they are modified like at each class period. And so step two is how they're gonna construct the notion. And so they have a complex task again. And so they have to create a, a mental map to show that they, that they understood and that they, they solved the complex task. And then, uh, they, uh, and then what they're going to do is that they're going to put it in common. So they put it in common and they produce the, what they're going to keep like in their, in their, in their book, the, the, the written trace. And so this is, this is in common, so they really build it. And then the next step is that they produce uh, something called like really I'm gonna pause. So they produce something that is not that is not written, but that is gonna really demonstrate that they understood the notion. And so, and then the next step is the the oops, yeah is that they they are memorizing it, but collectively. So that for example, like what they produced. So here they have they have like a sheet where they where they where they put what they understood and everything, and then for example what they produced to understand to demonstrate their understanding, it's going to be on the walls of the on the walls of the class, and then she uh, Marie Soulier she adds like QR codes with links to uh, to other tidbits of uh, of information that they need so that. During, like, during the year, they can go back to it, and because there is a, she has themes that she keeps so that she can, the, the students can go back to, their, to those previous things that they produced. And then what I would call type three is that when the students build their own learning path, uh, and so this has been put by uh, Olivier Souret and Marie-Camille Couder. They are teachers of uh, physics and chemistry in both high school and middle school, and they use this in both high school and middle school. So this is a, a picture of uh, one of their class. And so in, in their class, what they give the students at the beginning of the year is a grid with uh, competencies and skills that they want them, that they want them to, uh, that they want the students to have at the end of the year. And so there is a, so it's a grid which, which, uh, which has basically what they need in physics. So that are the core competencies in their discipline, which are not uh, specific by uh, really the core competencies. So being able, for example, like here, to talk the mathematical language, I know how to do a physics uh, exam. I, um, I I'm practicing the scientific. Um, I'm I'm thinking with a scientific approach, and then I learn to learn. And so with uh, with items uh, for for each notion, and then they also give them the official program. So this is the official program for this notion in uh, in physics. And then they tell the students, okay, how are you gonna learn it? And so they have to come up with how they're gonna do it. And so obviously they also provide them with some resources, but it's the, it's the job of the students to go find the resources that they will find useful. So basically, like they work by periods of two weeks. And so at the beginning of the two weeks, the teachers meet with the team because they work, they work in teams. And so, and the team say, okay, we're gonna work on that notion. They don't have to work on the same notion. Like each two weeks, they decide the notion that they were gonna work on. And then they propose to the teacher, okay, we want to do this. This person in the group is gonna aggregate the resources and then we're gonna work on those exercises and then uh, this is how we're gonna do it. And then the teacher says, okay, or not okay, or you forgot this, or blah, blah. But so 
it's, uh, and they change every, every two weeks. So again, I, what, I, what I've told you about is a lot, a lot of uh, different practices, but there are some strong commonalities, and I'm going to go faster because I was too long. And you probably know that that most of the most of the teachers they find that uh, the it it improves the autonomy, the motivation, and the, the grades of the student. Uh, that it's not the case for all the students. That it's uh, the, the, the the, the better students, they benefit less from, from the flipped classroom. Is, uh, so this is, uh, again, this is, this is just a, a questionnaire that we asked people who are flipping to, to fill, and so uh, 120 teachers filled it. And so I think that what it shows is that, obviously, good students, they're going to be good in any situation, and they're already good. And so, it's not, they say, there are only 60% saying that the flip classroom is helping the good students, and a lot of them are saying that it has no impact, just because the students are already good. And basically, I just wanted to add this, that the, it's really, it's really interesting, I feel, to, to put together the flip classroom and, what, it, and uh, what, what people actually do in their class with the meta-analysis did by done by uh, someone like John Hattie, because there are, again, I was talking about things that we have known for a long time that uh, actually are effective in class, and those, so this has been demonstrated by meta-analysis -analy -analyse, on the uh, on hundreds and uh, thousands of uh, education studies, and so what the teacher can do the the, the, one, uh, the one thing that has the best uh, impact according to those analyses is the fact of providing formative evaluation. That it's, the, it's a strategy, like the, the strategy that the, the teacher can do that has the most impact. And obviously, when you ask people who flipped, compared to before flipping, they did a lot more formative evaluation. And it's also more, more evaluation for them. They know, they know how the, the, the students are, are doing, but since they know, they have more feedback for them. And we all know that more feedback, it means that we are, we are um, progressing. And so maybe, and then I'm gonna stop there. What's interesting is that, so I've been documenting it in France for like uh, three years now, and what I feel is the most interesting is how when people start flipping, it doesn't look the same one year or a couple of years after. Is that you can enter the flip classroom, even with a very simple idea, I'm just gonna put the lecture at home, but once you put your finger in it, then there are all sorts of other questions that arise, the evaluation, the group work, differentiation, and that you need to keep adapting because you're faced with those problems that were, were either difficult or that you didn't have time to solve before. And uh, I think I've already been too long, so I'm gonna stop there. Thank you, Eloise. I think... Uh... Uh, I think that uh, your experience can be of great value for us, so thank you again very much. Um, you were talking about complex tasks. Uh, what you call complex task, uh, we call computo autentico, is almost the same, computo autentico. And uh, so it's something we are doing. Uh, I think uh, we miss something for this learning path that can be also of great value for us and I hope in the future uh, we can do it. For the audience, please take notes if you want to ask some question to them because uh, after both of them will speak, uh, we have some time for the questions. So just take notes of whatever comes in your mind and uh, we can uh, make the questions later. Good, so now Raul. Uh, coming, as I said, uh, from Spain, is uh, explaining us how, how it works in Spain. Raul, up to you. 
Thank you, Fabio. And congratulations, Eloise, for your speech. It was, you know, very motivating. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about the flipping learning, the flipping classroom experience in Spain. I am going to present you the, the website that we have been, uh, you know, developing during these uh, two last years. And we are very happy with the results, as you will be able to see due to the results we have been getting all, all over Spain. But I think first, uh, it's important to, to understand how do we understand or how do we uh, get a concept of the flipped learning in a, you know, in a huge uh, context. So um, as many of you probably think or believe, um, we consider that our students are the center of our job. So the most important thing in our lives, in our work, are our students. It's not the program, perhaps it's not the marks, it's not the evaluation, are our students. So when they, they ask me, can you say what's flip classroom, what's flip learning in two words? I always say it's common sense. You should apply your common sense to get the best of your students when they are in the school. Because we could start, you know, now debating now, are schools and universities really learning spaces? Or they are just teaching spaces. So we want to convert the learning space, the, the teaching spaces into learning spaces to get the best of our students when they are in class. So that's why they are in the, in the center of this picture. And they are surrounded by technology. This is another, you know, another of the legs of this, uh, of this I, I call this uh, the graphic of the onion, no? because it's full of layers. And the second one will be the technology. We know that they are uh, you know, um, surrounded by technology. Technology is very important for them. They use it all the time. So we have to, to get a rational uh, use of technology. Understanding that many teachers, most of us, have a, you know, a low level on this area. But we have to use and we have to do a rational use of technology in the classroom. The third layer, the, the blue one, will be the techniques, the activities, you know, uh, strategies, everything that teachers do in classroom. We cannot be, it's impossible not to be in this green, in this blue line. We do something in the classrooms. We explain, or we evaluate, or we you shout. We do things. But we think that these techniques, these strategies, should be um, directed by a methodology. That's why I completely agree with Eloise's uh, concept of flipped classroom. We, if, if not, we are just giving receipts. We have to know why we do things in this way, why we use we use the, the theory of the multiple intelligence. We use problem-based learning, project-based learning, cooperative learning, or challenge-based learning, or what you want to call it. And the last one will be the flipped learning model. We don't like to call the flipped learning a methodology. We, we think this is not a didactic methodology, but we understand that many methodologies can fit the flipped classroom model. And the flipped classroom model is going to, to make all these uh, methodologies much stronger much effective in the classroom. Uh, when, you, when, when, when we pass all these explanations, all these instrumental things to another place, the place at home or wherever it is. So that's why we understand that this should be the, the, you know, the model in which uh, teachers should be working. The most important thing are students. Students uh, work with technology. Technology uh, should be you know, um, linked with the methodologies and methodologies will be stronger when you use the flipped classroom learning model. In these different phases, we call teaching style, teaching philosophy, or even learning progression model, when teachers know exactly what technology they use uh, in a specific context with some students in a specific subject in January 2016. This could be an example of all these process in which you, you can see the flipped classroom at the bottom in, at home, the flipped classroom in the classroom, and then a specific methodology, probably you, you know, just in time teaching with peer instruction and how this is going to be work two, three, four, five, six, seven before the class. What, what is the teacher's role? What is the student's role? what he's going to do before the class, what kind of material he's going to present. 
short videos, attractive, motivating. How to evaluate before the class, we think this is the most important thing because our students come to class with very different levels. <laughs> so the concept of differentiation, I think, is the key, one of the key words of this, of this model. And then, depending on what is happening in the classroom before the, 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 the process and during the process, we could establish different strategies uh, within the classroom. So we could be talking about uh, describing this, this slide for, for one hour, but I think it's better to go now to see what we have done with the flipped classroom network in Spain. So we, we created this uh, project in, in 2013. This was uh, the result of an uh, uh, innovation program at the University of La Rioja. La Rioja is, I don't know if you know, it's famous for its wines in Spain. And uh, it, we were a few teachers. I am working in the Faculty of Education. There was uh, another one in the chemistry. Um, low, uh, nursery, five or six teachers that we always, you know, talking together about how to change, how to make the university a learning space, a relevant learning space for our students. And we created this uh, website called uh, flipclassroom.es.es, uh, which well, has come now, has become uh, probably the, the, the website for Flip Classroom in Spanish language reference in the, in the world. Uh, as I told you, we were just uh, five, six teachers, and during these two years, um, the growth has been has become very, very, very high. Uh, now we are we have a group of coordination. We are three, and we have 51 editors. Editors are specific teachers who work, and the compromise is to write at least. Uh, one entry or one experience or one tool analysis per month. So almost every day there is a teacher who explains, who shows, who analyzes a flip classroom experience that he has or she has done in the classroom. We also have a research team. Uh, we are working in a, a research line very similar to Eloise, as I will show you in a few, in a few minutes. And also a training, a training team with 25 teachers. And they are specialized in some specific areas, like mobile learning, for example, or creating the creation of, uh, of educational video, or how to evaluate with rubrics, or cooperative learning, or whatever. How to link all these, as I told you before, technologies, methodologies, with the, the flipped classroom model, the flipped classroom learning model. We also, uh, we are very lucky because many companies, or at least uh, a few of them, have trust us and they have support, they have licenses, and um, one of them give us money for developing this, this, this project. So we are very happy. The, the, the website is very attractive for, for many teachers, so we have, as we'll see in the next slide, lots of, of, of visits. At the moment, we have got 1,300,000 uh, during this uh, one year and a half, more or less, 433,000 users, and uh, more than 600 sessions. This is uh, also our uh, geographical um, uh, scene. You can see that uh, Spain, 55%, but many uh, speak in Spanish uh, countries, especially in South America, also in the United States, uh, visit us. Uh, every day. Um, as a result of this, we have um, published several articles, researchers, and also books. For example, the, one of the most uh, sold ones is the, the Flip Classroom, how to, go, how to convert schools in, in, in learning spaces. But another one about the mobile learning, which connects this you know, use of tablets, mobile telephones, smart telephones, with the use of technology uh, in the Flip Classroom, how to create a video with a, with a mobile telephone or with a tablet. Also this one, which I think is one of the best, inductive methodologies, and how to make problem-based learning with Flip Classroom, how to create cooperative groups in the classroom using uh, also the Flip Classroom learning model. And this is the last one, the one of the, on my right, on your right, is gamification. Have you know if the word is right? It's right. It's how to create, you know, a, a motivation, a motivating and an attractive atmosphere of, of work in the, in the classroom. So all of them, um, probably two or three books 
during this year uh, as a result of the work of these teachers uh, during, this, during these years. Another thing I want to show you, which uh, I think that uh, teachers appreciate a lot, is this uh, map, mind map that we started with the 20 tools that you can use for flipping your class. So after some months, we have converted these 20 into 120 tools. This is made with a, an online tool you probably know. It's called Poplet. <laughs> and uh, what we have done here is, you know, um, a division. Uh, a teacher can do two things in the first, in, in, in the first step. He can or she can not uh, choose materials which have been created for other teachers. You know, probably Khan Academy or Learn Cilion or Fish3 or uh, Thinkwell or Nomia, many websites where they can find uh, great, wonderful materials already done. But this implies also how to select which one are the best, uh, look for them. If you write um, mythosis on YouTube, probably you will find hundred millions of uh, of uh, search, so which is the best video for teaching this specific topic. So this is, you know, linked with the concept of content curation that probably you all know, and we think that this is another area in which our teachers have to be trained, how to get, how to choose good already um, materials created by other teachers. If he or she decides that there is nothing that fits uh, their objectives, we propose you uh, to create the material, and we have done this classification, this, this way to understand how to, how to do it. We talk about how to use a computer, how to, you can create easily a, a video from a PowerPoint presentation or from a keynote from, with a Mac, or you can you know, post-produce this video with a tool like eMovie or Movie Maker or something like that. But if you go down, you can see tools which are more uh, specific, uh, more complicated, probably more expensive, uh, like Wondersur, Captivate, Articulate Presenter, which uh, can allow the teacher to create very sophisticated educational materials, especially with video. So this is another option, how to create uh, materials using your personal computer that probably every teacher has. Another option is using the 2.0 tools. Tools like MoveNote, probably you all know, that allows to create um, videos online, even to, to, to produce a casting uh, mission at the, uh, at, at the time, or save them. And uh, other tools to um, enhance the, the video, like uh, Edpuzzle, Educanon, and many others that uh, make this uh, uh, videos, you know, more attractive, more motivation probably, make the student to, to pay more attention when, they, when she, he or she is working. Another one, which is one of the stars of, the, of this uh, poplet, is um, uh, Kahoot, that probably you know, to, to create games and competitions <laughs> in the classrooms, uh, probably the result of the knowledge that previously has been done. Uh, we include in this topic, in these two zero tools, um, tools like uh, Blend Space or Simbaloo, Lesson Paths, Scoop It, uh, tools that both teachers and students can use to create their own personal learning environments. Uh, the, you know, I, I like a lot the, the graphic that you show, talking about the actor, producer, and so on. So I think this fits very well what a personal learning environment should be. Okay? Because we, we have to train or we have to educate our teachers to, be, uh, to reinvent during their life. So they, they don't have to know things. They have to know how to know things in the future. So how to do it? with a personal learning environment, using these tools, most of them are free, can do it. And finally, we have created a, th a third um, topic, a third area, uh, which is uh, re related with uh, apps and resources that you can use with a tablet, with an iPad, with a, a Chromebook, or even. Because I don't know in Italy, but in Spain, many schools have started using this kind of technology in the classroom. So how to, how to produce a video with an app. I don't know if you know 
this one, for example, explain everything or show me that allows to make very easy uh, videos with a um, good quality. So this is an example of the result of, of teachers working together with different interests, working in different areas, probably with a different background, but all together have created this, which is a guidelines for all of them. Many of them, uh, you know, um, are scared when they see this picture for the first time. Say, so, oh, this is all, all this is what I have to do if I want to be a flip teacher? Of course not. Uh, I only use five or six tools. You don't need more than that. But this makes you um, see the, you know, uh, the, a panoramic of all uh, tools you can use and the ones uh, which fits better your personal situation. Um, another area in which we have been working is uh, research. Um, how, to, how can we know what a teacher should know before flipping? And we have created a questionnaire. I can show you the results that we, more than 600 teachers have been uh, tested with this tool to know what they should know the more red is the color, the worse for the teacher. And this is the general panoramic of Spanish teachers. As you can see, it's not good at the moment. It will improve in, the free, in, in, the, in, the few, in a few years. So things like, what is an open educational resource? What is a QR code and how can you use it for um, flip classroom? Uh, tools for creating video with an iPad, with a Mac, with a PC, with a Web 2.0. Do you know what the content of curation is? So everything that I mentioned before could be a question to ask the teacher who wants to start flipping the class. Not only technological things, but also, do you know, or would you know how to explain what a flip classroom is to the families? Because this is a very important point. If parents don't you know, support us when they are doing this strange homework, some of them say, they are not the homework, they are watching videos. Okay, watching a video is the homework. Okay? And asking one question, and, and it requires attention, motivation, and effort. So we have to change our minds. Sometimes we have to change the minds of our students, and many other times we have to change the minds of the families, that they understand that they are learning in a different way. Not the way they learn or the way they were taught. So this is something that we do in every uh, training before, and we try to apply the flipped classroom uh, model to the trainee teachers. If we know where our teachers are and what are their interests, what are their objectives, what are their targets, easily we will fit the contents, the resources, and the tools for, for doing a really uh, effective learning experience. Another research that we are carrying out is uh, in the line that Eloise also mentioned, is and what happens at the end. Uh, I don't know if, uh, Eloise, you mentioned uh, what the, the teachers think or the students think about the learning. Teachers. The teachers. So this is exactly the same. What do Spanish teachers think after having, um, you know, experienced the, the flipped classroom uh, in the classes at least for three months. We have used, we have used um, a questionnaire created originally by Thomas Driscoll. You can easily look for this on, on the web. And, and we ask permission this author for you know, translating to this questionnaire to Spanish. And we have applied this questionnaire to 600 teachers uh, who have been, uh, <coughs> so, sorry, students who have been uh, using flipped classroom. And those are the results, because when we um, ask things about learning, I think we should ask things like this. Do you have more interaction? Is there more interaction in the classroom with your classmates, with the teacher, or with the content? So if you see these bars, the one at the bottom, the green and the, the blue, when they are big, it means that this is a lot, very much. So as you can see, the first of the questions, which will be translated like, my interactions with the teacher and my classmates 
are you know more frequent and more positive and they say yes they are or my interactions with uh, the contents or with my classmates are also um, more effective yes they are questions like I have a better methods of better ways to uh, get the contents in different ways which fit my personal way of learning learning styles or perception uh, channels are more visual or more auditive or more kinesthetic yes they are or I have the possibility of choosing what kind of evaluation I can uh, use in my classroom yes I can or I have this is a very important question more possibilities to work at my own pace Yes, I have more possibilities to work on my own pace because uh, the materials are adapted to my personal <coughs> situation. Another one, like, uh, do you think that uh, the teacher uh, can evaluate you in a different way, uh, depending on your learning style? Also, as you can see, most of them say, yes, we agree, or we completely agree or we have more possibilities to show the, my, my classmates or the teachers what I have learned. You know, in the taxonomy of Bloom, the creation of contents becomes you know, uh, an evidence of learning. My learning is more active and experimental. Yes, it is also. And finally, I think that uh, the teacher can have in mind my strengths and my uh, weakness uh, as a personal student because I think that if uh, we if we don't think that all this innovation all these tools are not directed to personalized learning in this century I think we are losing our time because I think the end the, the, the real end of our education in, in this century is how to personalize the learning process at a maximum this is uh, our point of view, this is our experience, and we are working on uh, very hard on this uh, day after day. Thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, Raul. Muchas gracias. I think uh, you gave us uh, a lot of tools we can uh, we can try, and um, it, does this uh, presentation is available in your website? Yeah. So probably you will have the presentation uh, via Flipnet, or maybe we can um, maybe you can remember them your Twitter. your website. Yeah, or in my Twitter at Santiago Raúl is my Twitter account. Okay, now. Um, are you ready, Russell? Or? I think I'm. Can you? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the last speech, uh, Russell from London, he's going to talk about uh, Flipped Classroom in the UK and uh, all over the world since uh, he's traveling a lot. Okay. I'm the last speaker, yeah? Today. Mm -hmm. I'm the last speaker. Yeah, you're the last. Okay, lovely to be here. Uh, it's been a really interesting day. I've learned a lot. I've really enjoyed the presentations that we've just seen from Eloise and from Raoul. I'm going to try and make my presentation as practical as possible. I have been teaching since 1987, and I'm going to show you what I did. I actually started flipping my classes before I even knew what the flip classroom was. And so that's going to be my first example. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I started with the flipped classroom. I first flipped my classes in 2006. I was working at the University of Westminster and I was teaching multimedia to students on undergraduate degrees and on master's degree programs. And I was thinking to myself, why am I standing in front of the class teaching so much? Why can't I make better use of that time? And I knew that I could record a lot of the things that I was teaching in the lesson. I could record them or I could find material for the students. So I was thinking, well, I can get them to learn that stuff at home and then they can come in the class and we can do the coursework. 
So I completely flipped my classes. And what I did was I, made, I used something called screen capture, and I'm going to demonstrate a bit later just how powerful this technology is because it's at the heart of a lot of the flipped learning, learning content. So what we did was we really did do the, the Aaron Sands and Jonathan Bergman's original idea. That is, and, and I've met them on a few occasions, that is to flip the learning, get the students to do the learning stuff, the lower level learning skills outside of the class through video, through podcasts, through articles, and then in the class, we're going to process that, that learning. We're going to process it. We're going to activate it. We're going to work on the coursework or on group work, on pair work, etc. So essentially, the flip classroom had the two parts. The materials that I made available to the students to access at home, sometimes they found materials, sometimes I created materials, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. And then obviously coming into the class, and in that first flip, we did the coursework. We did the homework that we normally do at home. We did it in class. The students work through the coursework. Now, what I tried to do then was say, OK, I don't need to do so many lectures now. I didn't totally flip. I still did a few lectures, but I reduced the number of teaching moments and increased the amount of tutorial, group work, pair work time. It wasn't a complete flip. I still did a few kind of teacher-fronted things, but I reduced it drastically. Now. I want to make a few points about that first one. F really important, I never announced that this was the flipped classroom. I didn't even know it was the flipped classroom. I just simply changed the way I work with my students. I got them to access more content at home, and I gave them simple activities to do. And then in the classroom, I got them to work on the coursework. But I never said to them, we're going to flip the learning. We simply did it. And I think that's really important because, as Eloise was saying earlier, it's our freedom to organize the classes. I wasn't doing anything that I needed to go and speak to my bosses. I simply did it. And I didn't even announce it to the students. I was the only teacher doing it. There was no one else within the university doing anything like that in 2006. And very few teachers at that time knew of the possibilities of, of creating content, which I'm going to demonstrate in a minute. So as I said, I reduced the lecture time. I didn't completely cut it out. It wasn't a full flip. I just reduced it. I made better use of my time with my students, helping them with the coursework. It really created a good feeling in the class. A lot of the students become very motivated. They love the fact there was all this learning material online that they could work with. Particularly the stronger students could go off and push on with the coursework. And the weaker students could play the videos many times. So it really did create very quickly, particularly helping the weaker students. There are challenges, okay? And one of the biggest challenges with the flipped classroom is if we ask our students to access content at home and to watch videos and to do quizzes and to do activities, what about if they don't do it? What happens when they come in the class? And one of the things that I found very quickly was that this was an opportunity for differentiation. If a student came in and said to me, I haven't watched the videos, I haven't prepared for today, I said, okay, sit on that table there, get on with the activity, access the videos and do it while the rest of the class were working on something else. We've talked about a lot about this today, differentiation. We don't have to do lockstep. Some students will be working on different things. It's something that we can deal with, um, and, uh, but it definitely is a challenge. I also, as the flip classroom grew and other teachers became interested in the idea, it was true that thinking about what to do in the classroom was, was hard. Some teachers perhaps have a background in teaching history or sociology or economics, etc. They're used to doing a lecture. They're used to sitting at the front of the class. It was a real challenge for some of the other teachers when they got interested in the idea, what do we do with the class time? So there certainly are challenges with doing this. 
One of the key things I want to say, if you're going to flip your classes, that is you're going to give students access to content that they access outside of class, then use that learning in, the, in lesson with you in group work and pair work. That learning content that they're accessing at home needs to be very organized. The students need, need to be able to find it easily. So the videos, etc., that you provide to the students, they need to be well organized so they can go home, access the content, watch the videos, do the quizzes, be prepared, and then come into the class. Those were some of the things that I learned from that first project. And it was bit by bit. I started with just a few classes, and then it became a whole module. And then other teachers wanted to do it, and by the end, it was 50% of the whole master's degree was flipped. But I started really small. I started with maybe just one or two classes that I did like that. And it was something that grew. Now, I'm just going to make a point here. This is the very first flip I did. All of the learning content that the students access at home is still on the internet. We actually made the learning content public. We didn't even put it inside Moodle or inside Edmodel or Blackboard. All the learning content, and I made a lot of it, all of it was accessible online to anyone, not only my students. And you might think, why would you do that? Well, I thought that maybe it would generate a lot of publicity for the course. If students around the world were accessing these videos that I'd made for the flipped classroom, maybe they'd be interested in studying with me and coming and doing the master's program. So we put little advertisements at the top of the content, but the students can, any student in the world can access this website even now. It's about 10 years old now. And it actually worked. The numbers of students that joined the course grew over the four years that I was at Warwick University on the back of that course, of that content. It generated a lot of publicity. So one thing, the first conclusion I want to make is that we can use the flipped classroom. If we use some of that content in a clever way, we can use it for marketing. Now, I know a lot of you are working in state schools. That isn't important. But perhaps if you're working at university or in a private school, you're teaching English in a private school, maybe it will help people to be convinced about possibly coming and, act, and, and studying with you. Okay, so I'm very much a, a, um, a believer in this idea of making the content free. I want to talk then about something else. So my background is actually teaching English. And so I began to experiment with the flipped classroom. Now, we've seen this Bloom's taxonomy a few times today. And obviously, the same thing. I was thinking, in an English class, can I get my students to learn the stuff, the low-level stuff, can I get them to learn that at home so that in class we can do more communication, more group work, more pair work? Could I do the same as, as I'd done with multimedia? And so what I wanted to do was basically the grammar, the pronunciation, the writing skills, the exams, all the stuff that I normally do in the class, push that out so that in the class I could get my students to do more group work, more pair work, activate and process the knowledge. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of just really simple examples, and then I'm going to show you how I did this. This is just really simple examples of flipped classroom content that I built for an English language class. The first one is just simply a mini grammar lesson. Instead of me teaching the grammar in the lesson, can I make a quick video that explains the grammar point and the students access that at home? Yeah, I can do that really easy. Let's just look at a quick example. Okay, just something I've noticed today from your lessons and from your essays is that you're getting confused between despite and in spite of. The most important thing and the first rule to remember is that we don't use of with despite. So we say despite the weather. We say in spite of the weather, but we say despite the weather. So despite does not include of. Now we can use despite or in spite of with a gerund or a noun. So Okay, so I've literally just simply, and, and it took me one minute to do that video. I'm going to show you in a minute. I put that video online. Now I don't teach that in the class. When it gets to that point of the lesson, the students know they're going to access that at home. 
that I give them a small activity to do with it. Then in the class, we do something else. We actually process, maybe we do a speaking activity related to that content. So I'm trying in the flipped classroom to stop always doing the teaching, focus on the learning, get the, get the low level teaching passing of information, put that outside of the class. That's just one example, and I'm going to demonstrate in a minute how I did that. Let's just take another really easy example. Imagine I was teaching you for an oral exam in English, and I wanted you to understand that you're going to be doing an oral exam, and maybe you need to know, for example, first certificate, the different parts of the exam. Now, I could explain to you the first certificate exam here, I could do an explanation, or I could make a quick video that explains about the oral exam that you will be doing, put that online. It means I don't have to do so much teaching in the class. I can use that time for other things. So you go home, you watch the video that explains about the oral exam that you will be doing. And again, I can make that content in seconds. So this is a quick example, again, a real example. Now, I just want to provide you with some information about the uh, first certificate oral exam. Um, this uh, exam basically is broken up into four parts. And let's by just start by just talking about those four parts of the exam. The exam begins with a kind of mini interview. And this is where the interlocutor, the, the examiner, are. The students have got access to this. Every time they ask me, Russell, we're doing the oral exam. I can't remember about it. Go and watch the video. It's online. So I could tell the students, for example, tomorrow's lesson. Go on tonight, learn about the first certificate examination, learn about the four parts, because in the lesson tomorrow, we're going to do an activity with that knowledge. So now I'm not teaching about the first certificate in the lesson. No, the students do that at home. They come in my class and we activate and process that knowledge. Maybe we reenact the first certificate exam. We put the students into groups and they practice. So this is getting the lower level learning skills out of my lesson, getting the students to activate that or to access that content at home so that in class I've got more free time. I'm going to give you one more example and I'm going to show you how easy it is for me to actually do that. Okay? This one here. This okay, is this word building. Week's vocabulary focus. In this one here, again, why am I teaching in, in the class the use of the prefix im? I can make a little video, explain it to the students, they can watch it at home. Now I haven't got to do that in the lesson. I'm taking, I'm shifting, make better use of the class time for, for more creative work, pair work, group work, the higher order thinking skills. The lower order thinking skills the students can do at home. So I just do a simple video, they've got access to it as many times as they want. This is going to look at the use of IM as a prefix that we can add to words that begin with P or M to give them basically the opposite meaning. So just to give you some examples here, with the first one we've got is moral and we can add and say immoral. Now I'm not suggesting that this is the only material that the students access, of course not. I'm just saying it's so easy to make this material. And I'm going to demonstrate to you just how easy and just try to actually make it a point. So let me just close off, okay? We've been looking today at Bloom's taxonomy. Now, imagine that you were my group of students. You're all teachers, and most of you are teachers. I'm doing a teacher training course. I could stand here now and tell you all about Bloom's taxonomy. Or maybe, in a few seconds, I could make a video. I could save that video on the internet and tell you to go home tonight and watch Bloom's taxonomy because tomorrow we're going to do an activity that's going to practice using this knowledge. So I need to make a video for you. Maybe I find one on the internet, or maybe I need to make one myself. So I'm going to make one. I'm using something called screen capture. I just want to show you how easy this is. Okay? One click, and I can start to make that video. Okay, there are many of these tools. I'm going to start to, to record myself now. Hi, I just want to talk you through Bloom's taxonomy. When we talk about the lower order thinking skills here, we're looking at the basic passing of knowledge. So we're looking at understanding and remembering. 
We call this lower order thinking skills. One of the problems in education is often that is where the teachers go to. What we need to do is make sure that we also use the higher order thinking skills and develop those. So we need to get the students to apply the knowledge, analyze, blah, blah, blah. I make the lecture, it's done. That's done. I can click on the button and play it back. Hi, I just want to talk you through Bloom's taxonomy. When we talk about the lower order thinking skills here, we're looking at the basic passing of knowledge. So we're looking at understanding and remembering. We so I can make the video in seconds. Now, that could be Bloom's taxonomy. That could be a picture that you want to talk about. That could be a PowerPoint presentation. These materials, you can create them really quickly. So Raoul was talking about all of the media that you can find on the internet, and that's fantastic as well. But you can create your own content in seconds. I actually just save that now. All I do is click on Save As, and the video is mine. Then I share it with my students. It takes me just a few seconds to make content and suddenly, suddenly, dis suddenly change the way I'm focusing the teaching and learning. We can do that really easy. Let me just come back to my presentation a minute, okay? Right, okay. Now, I just want to talk about the, 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 one of the key things then in the flipped classroom tends to be what we call screen capture technology. That's one of the most common things that we use to actually produce the materials, okay? I've demonstrated something called Snagit. Snagit, but there's loads of these tools around. They all work the same. You can mark out the area, you can record yourself, and then you can simply upload that for the students to access. Okay, the one I demonstrated there is Snagit, but please, there's many of them. Screenr, Screencast-O-Matic, uh, Camtasia, Screencorder, they all do the same thing. They allow you to make learning content really quickly and be able to share it with your students. So I want to make the point that the flipped classroom is really easy. You can make learning content in free clicks. In just free clicks, you can make learning content. So when you're thinking about the flipped classroom, the last one that I've done, the, the, the work that I'm doing more recently, is to do with teacher training. And again, I'm applying the same kind of scenario. That is the idea that we get, instead of, for example, one of the challenges in teacher training is that we've kind of got to do two things. We've got to learn to use the technologies, and then we've got to apply that knowledge to our teaching context. So again, for a teacher training, this flipped classroom model works really well. I can get the teachers to go home and learn to use Blogger and learn to use many of the tools that Raoul was talking about and then come into the class in the face-to-face -face and think about how could they use it in their teaching. So instead of me teaching you to do a blog, to do a podcast, to use screen capture, no, I can make learning content or find learning content that you can access at home and then in the class time, we spend more time working in groups and pairs, etc., discussing how we're going to use it with our students. So again, the flip classroom, and this is the, the, the third flip that I've now done, the first one was multimedia, the second one was teaching English, the third one is teacher training, the, the work that I'm doing now, using again the same model of being able to flip the learning. So that whole idea of the homework, technical skills in teacher training, get the students, teachers to learn how to blog, how to use Ed model, and then in class discuss it. What are we going to do with these technologies with our students? Group work, pair work, analyzing, discussing, debating, higher order thinking skills. The link between the two is, is absolutely vital. I've showed you that we can make our own screencast, but of course there's loads of other material that we can use. This is just one part that I've showed you. But in reality, a lot of teachers, when they flip their class, like to make their own materials. So screencasting is a great way of doing that. Of course there are blogs and articles and lots of material on, on the internet as well, but screencasting allows you to quickly start to flip your classes and for you to produce the material. And in doing so, you're pushing 
the lower level thinking skills out of the class so that in the lesson now you do the more group work, pair work, etc., etc. I'm going to make three conclusions. First of all, start small. Just one or two classes, just one or two little things, explaining maths, explaining English, explaining history, little bits of content that your students access at home. And then make better use of the class time to get them working in groups and pairs. It's easy to do. Screen capture technology, there are many of them. I saw Rao had a big list up there. There are many of these technologies. Many of them are free. Many of them, as you just saw, need three clicks, three button clicks, nothing more. And think about, some of you who are perhaps higher level directors of schools, think about the potential of flipped classroom for marketing. If we put, the market, if we put the, some of the flipped classroom content online, perhaps it will generate interest in our institutions, in our schools, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Russell. I think uh, one of the main points for us, um, I switch, no, it's okay, a few, few more sentences in English. Um, one of the key points in our course in Flipnet is that most of the teachers are scared to, to talk and to record their voices and to record their faces. But as we saw, uh, Russell gave us a, a very interesting point. Uh, it's very easy. You don't have to do something perfect. You have to just to do something. And uh, something very easy and simple and made in three minutes sometimes uh, is easier and more important than something you prepare with hours and hours of thinking. OK, so now it's question time. Uh, I will give you. We have three, three questions or, or three hours of questions. What's the, the point? No. Three hours? I don't know. Comunque, eh, vi passerò il microfono a chi vuole fare una domanda e la rivolgiamo a loro. Se so, any, any questions? Uh, kindly, if you would like to make any questions or remarks. So... If we'd like to start, uh, we don't have any, we didn't pay anybody to break the ice and to start with fake questions. So, now good afternoon to everybody. I'd like to know from our European colleagues if in their universities during uh, teacher training courses there are some exams that are involved with uh, didactics, method teaching methodology, psychology, so we're talking about education, in order to prepare those teachers in the best of way, in order to be able to better interact with their, the future students. Can you hear me? Can you hear the question? So they just want to know, it, at university, in education, do they teach psychology, uh, teaching methodology, and so forth? Didactics. How to behave with children, or this is just uh, what you teach, or it's normally something that is already taught in the university, like flipped classroom and pedagogy. I, the question is if we teach technology in the universities. No, if university technology. prepares teachers with this? Yeah, um, not in Spain, <laughs> but uh, there is a big debate about that. And uh, in, some, in some universities, some professors and even some students think that there should be a subject called educational technology or something like that. I don't agree with that. I think that teachers have to use technology in our classes, in our subjects, and then we demonstrate how to use technology f to the future teachers. So. It shouldn't be something apart from the didactic, from the methodology. It should be inside, inside it. I don't know if that was the question. Did that answer? Uh, 
Well, in France, uh, there are there are two things, right? There is the initial training of the teachers, and then there is the continuous training of the teachers. So there are two different things. Uh, in the initial training of the teachers, it's uh, not much, I, I think. I think it's it's uh, certainly changing, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's actually I would agree with Raoul that it still needs to be really integrated with the pedagogy. That right now, in a lot of places, and this is both in the initial training and the continuous training, there are, those are two different things, like how to use that specific tool, and then this is the pedagogy. And so the two don't really connect. And so this is changing slowly, and, uh, and obviously we're pushing for it. But, uh, but yeah, this is changing slowly. At the flip, on the flipped classroom specifically, uh, well, when I came back to France at the end of 2013, I talked to the regional institutions training the, training the teachers. And I called them and I said, well, you know, the flipped classroom, it's going to be big. You, you should prepare for that. You should provide training. And they said, what? What are you talking about? And so I ended up doing that. This is how I ended up training teachers. Yeah, I said, no, I mean, you need to do it. And obviously, like, the demand is really high. And I used to, obviously, I teach, you know, the flipped classroom in a flipped way because otherwise it would be really silly. But a lot of people had told me, for example, that in their initial training, they are being lectured about active pedagogy. So that you have a class about active pedagogy yeah. with someone sitting on the stage and explaining to you. So things still need to change. Yeah, I think the same in England as well. The same thing's happening. I think that there's a big, uh, you know, uh, we need to practice what we preach. In other words, if, if we're going to begin to do this, we need to bring it into our own teacher training. I get invited around the world to do training. Obviously, when I do that, I do it in that form, the way that I was saying. Uh, but if I was to go into a sort of, uh, university where they're doing teacher training in the UK, that, that isn't happening unfortunately. It might be starting now. Yeah. Altra domanda? Sì, buonasera. Volevo chiedere. Now, good, e good evening. Now, from an editorial point of view, now, in your countries in particular, I'd like to know the following. Is there any uh, uh, other books and, and tools that actually facilitate the flipped classrooms that help teachers in their everyday work uh, in teaching classes with this flipped methodology? How much production is there in terms of books, material? In Italy, France, and United Kingdom, but publishers in, in Spain are in a very bad way, point at the moment because they are not selling paper or even electronic books. Many schools, many teachers are getting these new models and they don't know what to do. Uh, one of the main publishers in Spain uh, one year ago contacted me and uh, they proposed me to adapt their books into the flipped classroom learning model. So the, what they do is basically the same and they incorporate three or four proposals uh, so that teachers can use a flip classroom, multiple intelligences, or um, uh, basic pro problem-based learning with those contents. This will be the basic level, but they give another level and even, and even more for teachers who even uh, are not going to use the contents of the books, and they are going to make their own books with tools and resources and so on. So in Spain, the most important publishers are changing their mind and they're, you know, um, designing <coughs> different products for different needs at the moment. Um, can't you that? Yeah. Uh, well, in France, uh, it's uh, the same. And uh, I should say that there are actually startups developing. And uh, I, think that, uh, I think that publishers should start worrying and, uh, <laughs> and do something about it to, to start adapting. I also think that it's, um, it's really one of the, one of the two breaks uh, um, that uh, one of the two problems that I see to the diffusion of the flipped classroom, the first one being the, what I would call the, the intermediate people in the administration, 
who have not set a foot in a flipped classroom and see it as something that is uh, going backwards or something like that. And so they're criticizing without really knowing what it is. The second problem is the mutualization of, um, of, the, resource, of the resources that are produced. Because there are, there, are, there are teachers, they would just like to have, for example, a bit, uh, not more than the, than the tidbit that you made, but just really a, part, a little section of a, of a class, and they're not really familiar, and they want something which is prettier that, uh, than uh, a PowerPoint, which is basically what I use. But, and, uh, and there needs to be, we're working on that, like a platform where, as a teacher, you can just share what you've done, and nobody cares if it's perfect, but it's going to be useful for someone else. Just to see also what is being done and, and what, what you can do. Um, I think in the UK, I certainly know that in, in English language teaching, there is quite a lot of talk about it at the moment. There are, I won't mention any organisations in case they don't want to reveal themselves because I know that they are doing work on it. So there is a lot of interest. I mean, from my point of view, and that was you know point I want to make, you know, is that it, it, it would be great if they do get involved in it on one level because they can produce quality materials and then we can add to that, we can add our own bit. So we're using a, a, a mixture of content that the publishers have bought and, or, or providing and the stuff that we make ourselves. Of course, one of the things, and I think it comes back to a point earlier, is that up until now, a lot of the material that's in the flipped classroom has been completely free. And that's been a great thing. And obviously, with, you know, publishers are going to want to charge. <laughs> and that's obviously going to be an issue in terms of, of generating income. But yeah, I think that they've got a role. I think they have got a role. And I think that there are publishers in the UK, in English language teaching, that are starting to really look at this as an idea. OK, tempo per un paio di ancora ultime, una o due domande. E ho qui un'altra persona. Now, a couple of other questions. Now, good evening to everybody. I'd like to thank the excellent uh, speakers. Now, as to the university, from what I've heard, uh, most of the things that were done so far uh, refer to the university. Now, I'm, I'm a high school, high school teacher, however, and I'm very interested in involving parents. Why? Because parents so far have been the major stumbling block. Uh, they didn't understand what was happening, what was going on. So I wonder, shouldn't we use the flipped classroom also for the parents and send them a video, for example, which explains what this methodology is? I explaining that methodology by using the methodology itself. I think that I mentioned, uh, like, uh, I think all the teachers that I mentioned were like middle school and high school. And it's actually very, uh, it happens a lot of time that the, that the teachers use the flipped classroom. They, they produce a little video to explain to the parents what they're doing. Because it's also like, for example, the, the person that I mentioned, uh, Marie Soulier, uh, the one with the, with the road. And uh, she explains how it's actually a great way to strengthen the relationships with the parents. Not all of them. Okay, this is, again, Again, we're not talking about something which is miraculous or like don't expect anything like it but it's a way it's a way to put you know a little bit of the school at home and it's also a way to appease uh, homework I mean I don't know is for all of you like how you've lived uh, homework either as a student or as a parent but it can be uh, it can be difficult because you know as a parent, you've been to school, and so you know you know how you learn something, and then your kid comes back, and it's a different way, and it, because it changed, and it, it's difficult. A video, you watch the video. <laughs> there is, there, I mean, it's a much less uh, a subject to a controversy. So yeah, definitely, I think that the parents are. It's really great to mention them. Uh, I don't know in Italy, but in Spain, when they, when they finish their studies at the, the Faculty of Education, they have to do a work called the end of work uh, or the end of degree. And uh, the best one last year, the best out of 200 uh, uh, works, was called like this: uh, How to improve uh, parents' training of teach of of kids of three, four, five years old. So the work itself has to how was to how to use the flipped classroom uh, model to improve the training of the parents of three, four, five years old kids, and was the best one. In fact, the the girl who did it and 
practice with it was contracted by the school in which she did it. It was great. I think it's a great idea. Um, I know that, uh, for example, Edmodo, I don't know if you know Edmodo, but it, it's got a parent code, so you can get the students, in, you know, get the parents engaged. I think those kind, kinds of things are really important. We need the buy-in from the parents for them to understand why we're doing things in this way. And so, I, th I mean, it's not something that I've done, um, but uh, it's certainly something that I would do. I'll just make the point, the, comp the examples that I showed of English language teaching today, they were from you know, teaching in secondary level, teaching uh, sort of 15, 16 year old students rather than at university, the, the, the English language learning stuff that I showed you. Thanks, Sam. Forse nel sito la classe capovolta nel... In our website, the uh, flipped classroom, I think I saw something. Uh, uh, so perhaps there's already something available that perhaps could help you out. Now, we still have some time for uh, another question, a couple of other questions. Okay, thank you very much for your speech. I was just curious about one aspect. I mean, given for granted that the majority of the students were very happy about this new methodology, what were the main critical remarks they made? The part of the students who were not happy about it. What were their problems or in the three different countries? Thank you. I think that probably all of us coincide is uh, it requires more effort, more time for the teacher, also for the student. But uh, <coughs> so, some people say, um, you don't believe in the culture of effort. We believe to, to make, create a good video requires a lot of effort. To watch a five-minute uh, minute video and learn about uh, the cellular mythosis and ask, answer some questions requires effort. So, why? Because the point is in the student. The student has to learn. That's the point. And it requires effort and time. Uh, yeah. Maybe to add on that, because I agree, I would say that uh, yeah, it's not necessarily um, immediate that the students are going are gonna to like it. Because again, it, it initially, I mean, first, students, they are experts at school. They've been going to school for a long time, and they know how it works. And so if you, if you start doing that, you're changing the rules. So, and this is something, this related to something I was mentioning, that for, for the good students, it's even, it's even uh, for them, it's even harder because the old system works very well for them. They're very adapted to it. They're performing very well in it. And they're not necessarily working that much. I know that as a good student, I wasn't working at all in class. I would have hated it. <laughs> I'm, and, and yeah, because you know, something is working for you and, uh, and your teacher is coming and, uh, and changing it. Like, why? But, uh, but just that there, there, are, there are just a little, a little number of strategies that you do. But again, at the end, yeah, students like it. But yeah, it needs more work. A different kind of work, though. It's not like more work at home. It's just you work differently. The nature of the work that you do at home and in school changes. Yeah, that was um, some really interesting points. I mean, the, the, I think. The, the, one of the challenges to think about is, remember I mentioned to you that it starts with, I started with one, one course, one module, and then I, it grew into the whole course doing it. And then suddenly you've got five or six teachers doing flipped classrooms on one course, and that can mean a lot of homework for the students. 
So one of the things is that that then takes organisation between you as well, and that is one of the problems that as it develops as an idea. You know, it's okay me doing a little bit of flip classroom in my multimedia course, and that doesn't make a lot of difference to the, to the student's world. But suddenly, if we've got five or six of their teachers doing flip classroom and then asking them to watch videos at home, etc., and then do activities, then it can be, it can be overwhelming. And that's one of the reasons why we've got to dosify what we give them to do at home. And that's why short, and we've mentioned this a lot, short, sharp, right to the point videos is absolutely vital, whether it's stuff you make yourself or whether it's stuff that you find on, online, because otherwise you're going to end up overwhelming them. Yeah? Grazie. Una domanda qui. Grazie. Buonasera a tutti. Volevo chiedere all'interno now, one other question. Now, in these flipped classrooms, we talked about digital content, right, so far. Now, I'd like to know the role of traditional textbooks. In this flipped classroom, uh, do you still continue to use traditional textbooks, paper ones? Yeah, we, I mean, we talked about, about the digital tools because it makes, it, it makes things easier, um, also more engaging. The thing is that as, as teachers, we know how to read. And I was, when I say that, I mean that when we read, for example, a text, we know which information we're looking in it and what is important. And uh, it's not necessarily the case for students. And so this is, this is one of the reasons why, why videos are, are so useful. But uh, I know a lot of people who still use textbooks. And for example, who will give, who will pay attention to the different types of learner. And so for example, they will give either, either a video or, or a text to read. And also that the, the textbooks will be used, for example, also in class. So that, because you're, you're also teaching the students how to be more autonomous. And so that when they need something, again, you know, there, there are videos, but they can also go to, to textbooks. And some get tired of videos and also like to, when they, when they need to, to concentrate, and uh, instead of going back to where the information was in the video, to just go and, uh, and have a look at the, at the textbook. But, I mean, we've talked a lot about um, digital things, but the idea of the flip classroom doesn't need any digital thing at all. It can, it can all be made without, uh, without digital tools. And actually, it has been made without digital tools. But it's true that it's such a facilitator that it would be, it would be, uh, it would be a shame not to take advantage of it. I'm not against paper books or uh, textbooks. But I don't allow my students in the university to, to send me any kind of paper. Even an email, which is an obsolete tool, belongs to the last century, and it's a very confusing tool. Email, no emails, no USB memories, they are full of viruses. Everything should be in the cloud. That's my point, because since they are going to use paper and test with the other teachers, I want them to use digital tools with me. So that's my point. Um, definitely can use books as well, no doubt about it. I mean, I love books, I love writing in them. I don't think everything digital is always a good thing. I think I heard a point really interesting in the beginning today, the very first speaker, um, I've forgotten his name, I apologise, but we, we, you know, sometimes it's the, it, well, two things. First of all, it's the choice. Sometimes it's actually quite nice to give the students choice so they can watch a video or they can read an article or they can go to a blog or they can re re reference a book. Because uh, I think you mentioned, Raoul, you know, we've got different learning styles different people like to work in different ways but then the other thing is sometimes they complement each other so they they start with a video a quick a quick sort of a quick video that maybe is a resuming of something and then they read the article or read the chapter of the book and often that links really well together so it's often going to be a combination of the two but definitely course books you know definitely would you make use of them still in the class or for the outside learning as well thanks a lot um, so che Maurizio ha una domanda. Maurizio, a question? A question from uh, Maurizio. Now, when we started, we were very surprised because at some point we uh, 
acknowledge the fact that the weaker students, the ones that needed special teaching, were the ones that were happier over what we were doing. They were the ones who returned back home and told their parents, I finally found a teacher who is actually helping me. And uh, the parents would come to the parent-teacher uh, council organization and would tell us, thank you, because for the first time my child is, has started uh, uh, studying at home, is watching videos, and then at, in, at school they're able to work with other students who perhaps can help them out. So my son returns, gets back home with a happy face. And they're telling this in the parent-teacher council continuously, and they're telling others as well, why don't you use the, uh, the flipped classroom as well? And we're rather embarrassed at that point because not all teachers use it, and we feel a bit isolated. That's why we invited you here today. Because in Italy we're few, we're not many, and we would like, and we are aware that in the world there are so many people who are working in this direction. We are the only ones using the so-called cooperative learning. But in our schools we are alone, we're isolated in that. The uh, complex, uh, complex uh, uh, tasks, uh, we're the only ones doing that. Why? And sometimes we feel that we are uh, doing the wrong thing because we're the only ones. But then we see that those same things are done also elsewhere in France and Great Britain and Spain and the United States and we're reassured that no, we're doing the right thing. So we wanted to invite you here to see that there are actually people, physical people doing all of this. So did you ever um, live, did you ever experience this fear, initial fear that you are alone in doing these things and that others are not helping you out? You are not alone. <laughs> I think there are many more teachers who are doing flip class and, and they don't know they were doing that, yeah. the, the ones that are conscious about that. So perhaps there was a, a, I am, you know, I don't know if the word in Italian is right. It's, um, freaky, is that right? Freaky, a freaky person? A strange person who does, who does strange things? Yeah? You know, the Big Bang, the Big Bang Theory? Right. Well, okay. The Big Bang Theory person? This is me at the university. Okay? So perhaps you feel alone sometimes, but when you put your focus on your students, you feel that you are not alone. There are many people who are worried about this, and they are doing different things. But thinking on their students, on their learning, on their happiness. Um, yeah, I mean, you, I think you, you know we've got to we've got to be. There's got to be the people that start this off. There's got to be the innovators, and you've got to be a bit of a risk taker. And that's perhaps one of the reasons why I was saying to you at the beginning of my presentation: you don't have to announce it. You don't have to make out it's a big revolution because then you'll probably get the attraction of the skeptics. Just start doing it. But I think most important, and it comes back from Eloise's talk earlier, you know, this is the world we're living in. It's a world where there's loads of learning material out there. There's loads of opportunities for students to learn. On the internet, we've talked about blogs and videos and all the content that Raoul put up and the opportunities. We have got to reflect that in the way that we approach our teaching and learning because we've got to make aware, we've got to encourage our students to become more independent. In the future, they're going to need to learn and keep learning. They're going to not always have their teacher there in the classroom. They're going, to, they're going to get to 20 and 30 and 40 and have to learn new things. And we won't be there for them. And if we give them the flipped classroom and we give them the tools to become more independent learners, then we're going to help them massively. And that's what you've got to remember when you're trying to do the flipped classroom. And if some of the skeptics come along, then defend yourself and say, look, it's the way that learning's going. It's the way that, that, that our that students' lives are changing. Well, I wanted to answer last because I never felt that way. Like, I'm the crazy person thinking this is going to take over the world. And, uh, yeah, really. Like, I, I think that uh, in 15 years from now, more or less everyone's going to use it one way or another. 
so yeah, I'm the crazy person who started like the association in uh, in France when I said we're gonna do the the meeting. People told me, but uh, you want 200 people? And I said, yeah, but it's going to be too small. But uh, I mean, this is the first time we cannot do otherwise. And they told me, you're crazy. We're barely going to have 50 people. And I said, no, you don't see it. This is coming. This is really coming. When we did the week of the flip classroom, like 2,500 people came. Because again, it meets a need. Like, yeah. the thing is that it meets a need. Like. Most of the teachers that I know, they want to spend more time with their, with their students. And then there's just the question of how to do it. And the flipped classroom, once you know, and once there will be like enough material to, uh, to, to really start it, it's gonna, be, it's gonna become natural. And I'm starting to see it in France. That, so I interviewed many teachers. And, and I also asked them, you know, how does it go with your colleagues? And a lot of them have, have told me but that basically they're in the closet because they don't really want to talk about it, they don't want to be picked on because they're doing something different because if you do something different from the others, it means, even if you don't want to mean that, but if you're doing something different, it means that you don't think that what is done elsewhere is good for you. So even if you don't mean it, it's a criticism. So of course it's not necessarily well received. And, but what's happening now is that of the work that we're trying to do on the publicity of the flip classroom, now the people who were like loners in their institution, they've become resources. Because people have heard about it from another way, and so they want to know more and that they come to see them. And so instead of being, you know, the one teacher who's doing stuff differently and who's being picked on, he's a resource. Because he was not the one trying to impose what he was doing, even if he didn't mean to, but he's someone who knows more about that. And so this is why we're really trying to do, like to, to put the focus and of the discussion on the flipped classroom so that people know about it and they want to know more. So this is why I encourage you to do the week of the flipped classroom. I mean, pick any week, do an, uh, it was really useful. And of course, there are critics who are coming along, as I was saying. You know, people who are saying to people, for example, putting lectures on the videos, they're saying, yeah, but this is going back. You should be doing more like inductive work and things like that. I think that you should start wherever you can start. And then, yeah, do it bit by bit. And this is how it works. And the best defense that you have is that if this is working for you, that's it. You don't have to be the representative of the flipped classroom on Earth. You're just in your classroom. And you do what you feel best for your students. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so I'm very enthusiastic and, uh, and optimistic. Thank you. Thanks, Eloise. Sono ancora domande? Qua, da poco. Any other questions? Uh, una cosa. Visto che sono molti anni che usa... I wanted to know, since you've been using in your school for many years this system, do you have data, figures, comparable figures on the uh, results of the students, on uh, feedback on students, compared to students who don't uh, uh, follow, uh, who are not good in schools? Do you have comparable data on the different experiences? students who follow the flipped classroom with a control group. Yes, we have done some research about that, but th this is a perverse question because we are comparing different things. We're comparing marks with educational uh, results. And even that, uh, students who get the flipped classroom get better results than the other. So, in France we don't, and uh, I'm Again, my background is a researcher, so this is something that I, I think about a lot. It's, uh, first, I would say that it's difficult to have results about the flipped classroom, because as I said, there's not one flipped classroom. There are flipped classrooms, depending on you know, how, you, how you use it. Uh, 
second thing is that there are, uh, there are studies like that, mostly at the university, because at the university level, the teachers are also researchers, and so they document their own, their own practice, which is much less true in the, um, at the middle school and the high school level, where, where teachers will, I mean, they know what they do, right? Hear me out. But, they, but it's just that they won't publish it, they won't make it public in a, in a scientific journal. But so the, the few studies that are out, uh, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, they, they show this, um, this differential gain for the, uh, for the students who have the more troubles. And again, that the, you have more gain for, uh, for uh, more students more in difficulty, and then a little bit less for the students who are less in difficulty, and then much less, for the, for, again, for the good students. But so it's true that there are not uh, that there are not that many. The last thing I want to add is that there is not there are not that many studies on the flipped classroom, but there are a ton of studies on active pedagogies, and there have been for a while. And so that we know, I mean, it's scientifically, I think it's been established that there is no question to the point that we are at the stage. When people, when they publish stuff about the active pedagogy, they say this should be the control. Active pedagogy should be the control in any educational experiment. Because we know that the, you know, the frontal, front, frontal way, that we, we have, we have some, found something that is better than that. And there is actually one study which compares flipped classroom versus active pedagogies, but not flipped and they couldn't see any significant difference. Again, it's every study that you will find, it's, it's a study on one type of flipped classroom. So, and it's one study in, a, in there is no meta-analysis yet available on flipped classrooms. But definitely, I think that the, the, the most impact that the flipped classroom has is that it really, makes use of active pedagogies that we've known for so long, but that where it could be, it could be difficult, to, uh, difficult to put in place because it's time consuming. It's really time consuming. You don't do the same activity if you do it like actively instead of saying it, it takes more time. And so for me, the flip classroom, it's just actually, it's a, a little step that, that, that helps us going to active pedagogies. Uh, yeah, just picking up a little bit on your point, I just want to make two points. Um, actually, that one I did with multimedia training videos, the very first flip classroom I did, one thing we did analyze was the number of students that dropped out of the course, and that dropped. It, so it really did seem to benefit the weaker students. I've got no statistics about whether or not overall there was an improvement in learning, okay, and I'll come on to that in a minute. But certainly what we did notice was that fewer students dropped out of the module because we had quite a high rate of students pulling out. They had the videos, they could play them many times. It seemed to help the weaker students. I want to bring up another point, though, that's linked to that, and I think you were kind of touching it on there. That, and that is, if we're, if we're doing the flipped classroom, we're developing very different skills in our students, okay? In, in terms of what they're learning, they're learning to become more independent, to access the content at home. There is a bit of a problem at the moment, often with the way that students are assessed. In other words, if you look at some of the work in America, they're using a flip, flip classroom, but at the end, the typical assessments still sats. They're still doing their multiple choice sats. And this is a problem, and I know that that's a lot of the debate in America at the moment, saying, well, okay, if we're going to introduce the flipped classroom, since different skills are going to be developed in our students, we really need to assess them in a different way. And so I think that's really when we, you know, when we, the, the sort of the real complete revolution is when we get to the point that we understand that if we start flipping the class, we assess them in a different way. Hence, it would be very difficult to compare the old system with the new system, because really the new system is producing new skills in our students, and hopefully those are skills that they're going to need for the 21st century. That's certainly the debate that's taking place in America at the moment. Yeah? A lot. We have just a few more questions, if you can try to be as, as fast as, as you can uh, to answer, so we can answer more questions. Thank you.
Giovanna Verna, liceo scientifico che... Giovanna Verna, scientific high school in Rome, very very interesting, all of your lectures, just a reflection, I don't know whether it's a question actually. First of all, I wanted to say that cooperative learning is used also by teachers who don't specifically uh, apply the method of a FIP classroom. Today I discovered that uh, CLIL kind of provision is very similar in its structures, methods to the flipped class. So what I want to say is that that maybe if we consider it in, in terms of what is old and what is new, it's not helpful in encouraging colleagues that still use a um, traditional classroom to adopt this new method. I think that the solution could be an integrated approach. For example, when we need to explain, to communicate a lot amount of content and segments of uh, traditional classrooms are very useful. So uh, here I heard you spoke by bit by bit to, 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 to with gradual steps. So what we do, we use various uh, techniques, various methodologies. I would avoid the idea of us versus the rest of the world. And there are not few of you because many of us do many things that uh, actually share many uh, basic concepts of uh, a shared classroom. So let us not only share the new methods, but let us dialogue, let us exchange our experiences. It's not that we don't have need to throw away everything that is old and replace it with a new method. These are, all of these tools are helpful, of course, to grow, but I would avoid you know, closing it into segments, into barriers. That's an absolutely excellent point. And I want to, um, when I first come across the flipped classroom in English language teaching, one of the first articles I wrote was, aren't we already flipping the classroom in English language teaching anyway? Because in the class we do a lot of pair work, we do a lot of group work. I'm, I'm sure in other courses as well, my, my experience is as an English language teacher. So in answer to your question, absolutely, definitely, you know, it isn't a them or us situation. It's really, we've got, you know, many different techniques that we use, um, but I think it has got a lot of value as an idea, definitely. If I can summarize, I, I think we will say that traditional teachers shouldn't complain about they don't have time for covering the program or dedicate time in class for practical things. If, we were, if they were flipped, they will have time for both, for covering the program and spend the time in the classroom for practical things. My comment was that uh, I, I agree with you. I think I, I incorporated it in my, in my presentation, saying that the word flip classroom appeared like recently, but like collaborative work was much more, more older. And this is why I put like all the pictures of, of uh, dead people, <laughs> not just for fun, but uh, yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, Are there questions? Good evening. We would like to know if the experience of a river flip classroom in your countries is applied also in primary schools or to what extent, how much, and what, what are the results in primary school? So to me, it's interesting because I feel that the more you go up in education and the more rigid it gets, and so in primary school, for example, collaborative, at least in France, uh, collaborative work, for example, is much more used uh, than in middle school and high school. And again, you can see it just by looking at the physical organization of the classrooms that you will much more often see, you know, like little groups of tables in primary school than you will like later on in education. And I'm not even talking about like, you know, big um, places like that at the university. And, uh, and so then the need is less because people who, go, who, who come to the flipped classroom or to collaborative work, they come to it also because they feel that it's one, one of them for 30 students and then you're just, you cannot just talk for the best ones, you cannot just talk for the ones that are you know, the not good ones, so you have to adapt to the middle ones, but then you let go like of the others. And, uh, and so there is a need to really address all the students. When you're already doing collaborative work and the need is much less. 
I still believe that it adds something to it. So we have approximately like 10% of our flippers are primary school flippers. But the, and, and for them it adds, it really, I mean, I think that you said that uh, it, adds to, it adds to like all the methodologies. But yeah, the, comparatively speaking, there are less. Because, because the, because, yeah, I mean, as I, yeah. uh, In Spain, there are a lot of primary teachers who, who apply this model. Um, and there is one school in Zaragoza, which is in the middle of Spain, which is a complete flip school. They call themselves like that. So this was uh, a school was about to disappear because due to the lack of students. And they introduced four years ago um, mobile learning, iPads, cooperative work, multiple intelligence, and flip classroom. So they had 100 students. They have 400 students at the moment. So it was a big success. If you want to visit this school, San Gabriel, uh, in Zuera, Zaragoza, I can tweet it now if you want. OK, one question from Grazia. Good evening. My question is to Russell and also to the other two speakers, of course, because his experience is a 10 year long experience of a flipped classroom. But of course, also, the, I would like to know the opinion of others. An idea that we Italian uh, flip, flippers are trying to follow, but which still has not been launched because our experience five-year experience, or let's say maybe four-year experience as a flip teachers is to organize studies, statistics studies that will involve the students to see the results in time. And I would like to know whether you have experience in the countries you have visited as uh, trainers or in your countries of origin, if you have experience of surveys, of studies, retrospective, uh, starting with the primary school, following all the, 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 the educational process. It would be very interesting to see. Uh, a boy, for example, who was raised, uh, educationally raised, with this methodology. It would be very interesting for us also mm, to organize, at best, our, our teaching tools. here to answer that question because I mean I'm not actually a researcher at university and uh, my two companions are so um, I, you know I can't I, I've not really done any kind of research into the impact in terms of learning I said I did look at the, the I did do some research into the impact in terms of dropout rates of, of students and so, as I said on, on the multimedia courses that more students actually stayed on the module that I taught on but I'm afraid I haven't got any statistics about that and I'm guessing in a way that that information is only just starting to emerge because really the flip classroom kind of kicked off around 2009 2010 and so there is beginning to be an emergence of research papers available uh, I know in the horizon report 2015 um, the, the, there is reference to some really good pieces of research there, but I'm afraid I've not done any of that research. Probably my, my uh, two esteemed colleagues at, here at the table here, they may probably know much more about that than I do. Uh, I think we are too young for having these kind of studies. I don't know if you agree, Eloise. Um, we could call them meta-analysis or longitudinal studies. We need more time, I think, for this, uh, uh, for this type of test. And also, I agree with uh, Luis, we will have to define exactly what a flipped classroom should be in order to, to, to compare with yeah. other uh, years, uh, intra or intergroups. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we, we, with the association, we're, we're thinking about the, those questions of, uh, of evaluation and, uh, and things. And uh, it's not easy. Uh, I know that Soque uh, a Treviso, which uh, that in Treviso, the city of Treviso. I don't know if you are familiar with H Farm. It's 
it was quite famous. They are trying. They, they, we were called for to 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 explain the flipped uh, classroom. They want to build a school that starts with the primary and brings the student up to almost at university level, a kind of a school citadel, a school uh, town, let's say. Uh, those who have more money than us are investing in this project, and uh, that's what happened. So we're going to see in time. So is there time for the last question? Is there? Were there other questions? No? Other questions? Enough. Okay. I think we can call it a day, and I want to thank our distinguished guests. <laughs> and I will leave the floor to Maurizio Maglioni for final remarks. So I think we're all a bit tired. And as soon forbidding, there will be a last five minute break. And those of you who want to stay on, the members of the uh, Flipnet Association can stay on. We will have our annual assembly where we will talk about and decide about our future. We heard a lot of things spoken today. We have to decide what we want to do the coming year, how we want to invest the small amount of money we managed to collect. We have to become stronger, we have to grow, we have to manage to put to advantage a few things we learned and we see that the future of our students, we want it to be different from what is from the various scenarios of the Italian school today. Unfortunately, Italy, and I'm ashamed about this uh, when compared with other European countries, has a a uh, low record of university students, no figures. We are the last in Europe. There are many reasons for this, but certainly if a school did a little bit more to teach how to teach, to make sure that when students enter university, they can learn on their own. Unfortunately, in Italian schools, they say study from page 10 to page 15. And then when you go to university, this doesn't happen. You need independence, you need a sense of responsibility, initiative, the ability to learn how to learn. You need the eight European skills. And we have to make it happen. We are a s small group that is an avant-garde group, but we have a great responsibility that shouldn't be a burden because we discovered a friendship that we didn't have previously. We are people and when we l confront each other, we discover we are brothers and sisters because in our hearts we cherish the same thought, the same passion, the same enthusiasm that Affinati spoke about, that Lucangeli spoke about, this uh, enthusiasm that brings us every day to school, in our classrooms, to address our jobs, our work with a new spirit, with a new approach, with a sudden feeling of closeness towards our students. Nothing will take this away from us because it is a disposition of the heart. And we discover that we are friends, we discovered a new way of teaching, and in this new way of teaching we are helping each other. Somebody told him, thank you Maurizio Maioni, you are involving so much the people of Flipnet, but it's the other way around. The people of Flipnet are involving me, you're encouraging me with, with, your, with your emails, with your contributions on Facebook. You are bringing forth an enormous enterprise. They, of course, are made more progress than we did, but we are following suit. We're following in their wake. They came here to show us our future, and uh, our future will be that next year we won't be 300, we'll be 600, in three years, 1,200, and that and we will continue doubling the figures because schools need us, school children need us, youths need us. 
They need somebody who will teach them something that is worthwhile living for, something that will be important for them when they leave the school, when they complete their studies. We are working, putting a lot of effort in all of this. We create a database of videos this year. We divided all the videos in, in subjects. So every next flip, flip teacher will find the materials that we have made, but everything need, not all subjects were covered with our videos. We need a database of the complex uh, tax, tasks. We already created the geolocalization of the teachers. We know where they are especially those of our that teach our subject we know their website we can look at the websites of those who are teaching our same subjects and see what are their complex uh, tasks but we need more organization so next time when just few will be left the members of the association when those who thanks to their goodwill their determination, their volunteer work, those who want to help us further this idea and promote it, that we are trying to spread as much as possible. I will end here. I will tell you more about it later on. And to those who are saying, I don't want to take advantage of this time. We worked all day. We learned many things. And as of tomorrow, we will start afresh with even greater energy than before to flip the school and flip our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Have a good day.